day that they expect to go back to the Senate to look at the proposal by Senator Were and also to see whether this time, this time, they'll cross over the line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ugh, crazy stuff that's going on here. Yeah. But remember, we are all fighting COVID-19. In this war against COVID-19, a lot has happened in the last 24 hours, fellow Kenyans. In the last 24 hours, some of the lowest cases that we've seen reported so far. Uh, also, this is uh, against testing that's happening in the country. Um, 271 cases in mm. Kenya. This mm. was recorded yesterday, taking the national tally to 30,120. Uh, 474 fatalities with a good 16,567 um, recoveries. Still at under 400,000 cases, 391,416 samples having been tested around the country. Mm. And now we see that Nairobi still being the highest is followed by Uwasingishu and Migori, interestingly, in Migori, where a hundred beds were stolen, hundred beds were disappeared, <laughs> cannot be found. I don't know how else you want to describe it, but all right. The third highest um, numbers in the country in that particular county. If we want to look at this vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, twenty-one million eight hundred and twenty-four thousand eight hundred and seven um, positive cases so far for mm. COVID on the globe, with fourteen thousand. I'm sorry, with fourteen million five hundred and fifty-eight thousand three hundred and twenty-eight of those having recovered. Okay, so now let's look at this country by country. Um, where it continues to stand out at us, the United States, 5.5 million, still continuing to report cases of spread of COVID in schools. So you have children now under the age of 16 now being affected across the United States, specifically, specifically. <laughs> <laughs> Tricky word, that. <laughs> Particularly, <laughs> okay. Carry I told on. you it was a quiet weekend. I didn't speak much. Mm. So specifically, uh, in the southern United States, mm. um, Florida, Louisiana, Georgia, um, they continue to um, um, discover new infections here. The question is: Has this community transmission come as a result of schools having? Oh, opened again and some parents then refusing to take their children back to school um some parents now saying that they will will, will they will do online learning for their kids and they're not going to put them in harm's way the president remains hard and fast mm. on this and says schools are going to remain open we're not closing schools we're going to fight this thing tooth and nail okay brazil with now three million three hundred and forty thousand one hundred and ninety seven cases and india Climbing steadily, very rapidly, actually, because we now see India is probably going to get to the 3 million mark in no, in no time. And of those 3 million, 51,000 have resulted in death. Of those 2.6 million, rather, 51,000 have resulted in death. And Russia is inching closer and closer to the 1 million point mark. With South Africa's infections having slowed down just a tad, they're still pretty high at 587,345 with 11,839 deaths. Mm. Now, interesting something that has happened, Peru. Peru was one of those countries that um, had quite a number of infections as Central American uh, states. But now, having gone beyond the cases that Mexico, who we've been looking at over the last couple of weeks, has had. Peru now with 535,946 cases. However, they have more cases than Mexico but they have half the number of deaths, even less than. So with 535,000 cases, they've got 26,281 deaths. And Mexico, with 522,000 cases, has 56,757 deaths. What's that being attributed to? The thing is that Mexico, at the, at, from the very beginning, they were never able to get a handle on this. And by the time that they started to look towards um, medical care, or the system itself, mm. um, it was people had actually gotten to the point whereby the symptoms were very, very bad. Mm. Um, the, the proximity of their borders with the United States, of course, cannot be ignored with Texas and New Mexico having some of the highest cases um, on, in the continental U.S. But bear in mind also that the population of Peru is a quarter mm. of that mm. of 
Mexico. Mm. So even if you look at the numbers, the numbers, if they are equaling uh, Mexico, mm. that should be alarming. They are surpassing Mexico. They're actually more. Yes. Yeah, they're more. Yes. Because Peru with 33 million people and Mexico with 129 million people and Peru having um, more than the number that is in Mexico, that's a problem. So 83,000 tests per population turn out positive. 796 deaths per 1 million population and 16,227 total cases per 1 million population. So, I mean, it's big numbers here that we're looking at. These numbers will continue increasing. Mm. Yes, they will. Uh, there may be other reasons. There's a multiply effect that comes with a certain threshold of infections having been reached, mm. but then there is also the contribution of testing. Mm. And remember, in the absence of testing, it is very possible that people may have been infected and yet they do not know they've been infected. Yeah. Then when you throw in the equation of uh, people who are infected but are asymptomatic, then you have a tender keg here, actually. True. Because, again, we now then delve into the realm of the things we don't know. And what we don't know about COVID is something that should be of great concern. Mm. Yes. True, the unknown should concern concern us. Every time you read of a country that seems to have had a handle on it, something else pops up. Mm. Now, this to me isn't bad news. It just means that there are very many cases that were underlying. They were not known. Mm. There are people who had even tested probably negative, but maybe that was during a window period. So mm. the reality about COVID is that in many ways, it's still early days yet. There is still a great deal more we do not know mm. about COVID. So... Whatever we know, we should hold fast onto for the simple reason that if it will help prevent either the possible uh, infection or it will keep you out of, should we say, harm's way, the, the infectious harm's way, then you should. Because in the absence of that, what you, we will end up doing is ensuring that these numbers now rapidly move upwards. Upwards. Yes. Mm. Speaking of countries that have been able to keep things under wraps, we've not looked at Rwanda for a while. Rwanda's cases now are at 2,453 with eight deaths. But look at what they've been able to do with just the information that they do know. And being concerned about the unknown, Rwanda has still been able to keep this relatively concerned. We know that Rwanda has a popula population of just under 13 million people. However, they've been able to contain this in a manner that, honestly, nobody else has been able to. And we want to look at Uganda as well. We heard President Yuri Museveni saying last week that, you know what, guys, you don't need to be in these political rallies. We can still keep this thing at bay if you stay um, away. And Uganda, with 1,500 cases, has 13 deaths. Um, this is a typical example of practicing what you preach. And they've actually been able to keep this thing. When is content. Uganda's next general election? 2020. Yeah. 20, hold, on. Yes, hold on. He just got uh, the nomination. He got the nomination. So... Yeah, it's next 2021, year. Twenty twenty one, yes. It's next year. Yeah. So let's give him time. Mm. As think he, he says might that. change ah, his stance and go out and have public come rallies. On. <laughs> let's stay. We've been able to keep COVID at bay. We've been able to, you know, um, contain. That he was it driving around well. and people wanted to come and greet him. He, and he told, told them, them hey. no, 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 stay back. Stay, stay back. back. All right, stay back. Okay. I have not yet returned to my father. Mm. <laughs> Let us give him some time. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> and see. Ever when the campaign it. period gets into proper High gear, gear uh, the stance might but just I consider change. also mm. that COVID is an opportunity in very many ways, some mm. very positive, some completely nefarious. Mm. See, because of COVID, can you imagine the number of rallies you can just put a halt to? Yep. Can you imagine the campaign You'll process? You'll be the only one who's talking using the national platform <laughs> and then everybody else. Mm. Mm. He'll be able to contain everybody else, but he will be able to walk, to drive around. There's, there's that and stand somewhere and tell people, stand, st stay far, but you see? But there's, yeah. there's that little detail. And <laughs> there's also time to improve radio services, yeah. TV services. Yeah. All manner of things that would, should you say, assist in this process of campaign. <laughs> six, uh, quarter past six, this is a situation room, Kenya's biggest conversation. Let's see how the weather looks like today, this 17th day of August. And then we start to look at the big oh. stories of the day. Good morning.
The weather with Spice it's FM. It's Nairobi at 13 degrees. We're going to look at a high of 23 today and a chance of showers later on. It's light rain showers already being experienced in Yeri at 14 degrees. It's going to go to a high of 21 and lows of 13 where it's partly cloudy in Nakuru this morning. It's going to be wet later on with highs of 24 and lows of 13. Mostly cloudy conditions is what we experience in Eldoret this morning. Thunderstorms are forecasted for later with highs of 20 and lows of 12. In Kisumu it's partly cloudy at 20. It's going to warm up a little bit to highs of 28 and lows of 19 and the showers that are expected will cool things down considerably. It's always going to be a wet afternoon in Kakamega. It's currently partly cloudy at 16 and we'll see highs of 24. 24 degrees and mostly cloudy in Malindi. Highs of 28 and lows of 23. Three. In Mombasa, it's cloudy at 23, highs of 28 and lows of 23. Showers are expected to start any time now. Let's look out into Kampala where it's partly cloudy at 19 degrees, highs of 26 and lows of 19 with showers expected later. Mostly cloudy conditions is what we'll experience in Dar es Salaam today. Currently at 22 degrees, we'll go to a high of 30 and come down to a low of 21. It's a chilly crisp morning in Johannesburg at 4 degrees. Highs of 19, coming down to a low of 3. In Lagos, this morning, it's 24 degrees, clear skies. Sunny conditions expected for the day. Highs of 29 and lows of 23. Let's look into Paris, where there's a thunderstorm warning for yellow later. Partly cloudy conditions currently at 17 degrees and a sprinkle expected later to turn into thunderstorms with highs of 24 and lows of 16. It's also 16 degrees in London currently. Clear skies. It'll change later though to thunderstorms as the rainy summer months continue. Highs of 22 and lows of 16 and wrap things up for now in New York. Where it's mostly cloudy Sunday night at 21. Waking up into Monday morning. Highs of 22 and lows of 19. Classic soul, R&B, smooth jazz, neo soul, and nostalgic ballads. Make some noise. Yeah. You're listening to Spice FM. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice FM. and a half minutes after six o'clock. Good morning and welcome to the Situation Room. If you're just joining us, the live stream is up. Spice FM, KE, Facebook, YouTube and Twitter, as well as www.spicefm.co.ke. CT Muga. So you said this is a week for Kenya. Not week. Yeah. This is a week where Kenya will get prominence. But even as I was thinking about this, something interesting occurred to me mm. that... When I look at these proverbs and mm -hmm. sayings and I translate them into a language that I know beyond English, Sikh, Swahili, or my mother tongue, mm. I was amazed to find that the equivalent is actually available in many languages. Mm. So this is a week where I will mention specific proverbs or specific sayings that are Kenyan, but I would like our listeners to perhaps give it a thought and f try and find the equivalent in their backgrounds. In their, in their languages. Yes, and because what I found was that somehow the meaning resonates a little more. Mm. Okay? Mm. Now, the saying that I, I wanted to uh, put forward this morning is a very simple one. I've, I found it interesting in, it, in its simplicity. It says, when a man is coming towards you, you need not say, come here. <laughs> when a man is coming towards you, you need not say come here. Or let's make it gender sensitive. When, when a person when somebody is coming, coming towards, towards you, you, you need not say come here. Go ahead in there anyway. Anyway. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> is there a Swahili version of that? I thought about it mm. and I couldn't come up with anything that could perhaps be an exact replica. Mm. But what I thought yeah. was one which came close was yeah. Subira Huvuta Heri. Yes. Mm. All good things come to those who wait. Mm. Mm. So if yep. it's coming, it's coming. If it's coming, it's coming. It's heading in your direction. Mm. Mm. Okay. Let's start with the headlines. What do you have? Huh? Let's speak. 
<laughs> and interesting. It's all big. Okay. So, um, okay. So let's look on search. For, uh, okay. Search for 2022 poll line gathers a space or rather gathers yeah, space really or pace. Uhuru successors is what it's being called here on the front page of the standard. Kotu boss Francis Atoli yesterday hosted a delegation of Jubilee, Kanu and ODM leaders in, a, in his Kajado home. Uh, from David Morave to uh, Peter Kenneth, as well himself, Gideon Moy. And I'm very happy to know that they're all wearing masks, at least this time. Mm -hmm. um, and looking into the details of that story, unfortunately, we're already getting people um, revved up back into uh, election and politicking mood, as it were. And so there's a succession in the, in the offing, is what we are being told. Um, <laughs> governors... Uhuru Raila win governors in last efforts to end the cash sharing row. Governors have thrown their weight behind the proposal to freeze imp implementation of the disputed revenue sharing formula until the county's vote is increased to 348 billion shillings. The governor's support a proposal by nominated Senator Petronila Wera that counties continue with the expired second generation formula that shared out three three hundred and sixteen point five billion shillings until they receive an additional thirty one point five billion from the exchequer. The proposal is said to have the backing of President Uhuru Kenyatta and ODM leader Raila Odinga. It differs from the one fronted by Senator Mithika Linturi and which has the backing of Deputy President William Ruto. Linturi's formula proposes to cap the equitable share at 270 billion and the difference of 46 billion be subjected to the Commission on Revenue Allocation sharing formula. It was backed by governors. The proposal backed by the governors will ensure that no county loses funds. However, a closer scrutiny of the formula shows that nine counties stand to lose more than 22.5 billion shillings, with Mandera leading with the losses of 1.3. Okay. <laughs> Now, ahead of today's crucial vote, the uh, Council of Governors has officially voiced its support for the Were formula. Uh, the Council's chairman, Governor Wycliffe of Paranya, called on the divided Senate to adopt the amendments by Were so that counties can begin to receive shareable revenue. Mm. I am told, and I quote, there is a proposal by Senator Were which is proposing more money to the counties. This means all counties will be cushioned. It is a proposal that we support as governors, according to Oparanya. I plead, I plead with the senators that it is their responsibility to pass County Allocation of Revenue Act with the amendments by Were that will now ensure we get 348 billion instead of 316 billion. Uh -huh. So Senator Were's proposal is the one that she started tabling before they adjourned. Hmm. And now they're coming back to continue that conversation this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, there are those that have actually also started arguing that, you see, what Senator Were's proposal is basically saying is the difference between Sakajas and Were's. Sakajas was saying, look, let's look at the 316 billion shillings, 0.5 billion, mm -hmm. that uh, counties are going to receive this year. It's a similar amount to what counties were receiving in the last financial year. So use the same formula that was used in the last financial year, that is Formula 2, to distribute this 316 billion shillings. Should there be any increase in future allocations to counties, even by a bob, that shilling is subjected to the third basis formula. Hmm. But the cap is 316 that shall be distributed according to basis 2, and then everything else according to basis 3. Then in comes Senator Wary. Was she to be the one to be asked? She would say that give that 316.5 billion shillings, yes, but increase at 31.5 billion shillings from the National Treasury to be used in with the new formula. Hmm. Now, it's not clear to many how this uh, 31.5 billion shillings is going to come from the National Treasury to the formula. Using what law? Hmm. Because... Um, Already, the division of a revenue bill has been passed, mm. which is talking about how much the national government retains, how much the county the government county retains. receives. Yeah. So this 31.5 billion shillings, what is it going to be called? Is it coming in a supplementary budget or something else? I mean, that, those are the details that are still... I think, I think in responding to that question, one, mm. I, I, the question that comes to my mind is, what is really playing out here? Mm. 
I mean, there's the usual suspects. We think, well, you know, mm. it's 2022. Everything is 2022. Yeah. And uh, then there, there seem to be some young Turks who seem to have decided to uh, move away from the script. Yes, that's what it actually appears to be. But what really is playing here? Because what if all this is all choreographed? What if it is? Because it, I can't run away from that little thing that was snuck in there saying that it's a boost for Huru and Ryla in the cash row. It's turning it all to seem as if the two sides are either, you know, supporting for um, the presidency or for uh, particular powers that be, mm. as opposed to it really being an issue of coming together and agreeing. Um, so, I mean, it, it's... It, it, which it would show you that it could be more than just out, uh, allocation that is playing out here. Well, let me look. With all that's happening right now, uh, huh? uh. Uh, people being <laughs> almost arrested overnight, people being asked questions, accounts being frozen, loss of sleep overnight. Mm. It's a little. It seems like it, it's more than just you know um, a debate over how this county cash will be allocated or shared. Um, it would seem that people are being pressed um, in a corner uh -huh. uh, to make a certain decision or to lean in a certain direction. Mm. Why? To... That's the thing, though. What kind of leverage does it give you for politics? For in instance, all along, if we look at uh, the way the, the, this conversation has been framed, it appears as if Raila and Uhuru are on one side and yes. they're the ones who've been insisting and not moving and not budging. Yeah, Why? Well, that's why I'm saying that why, why, why are we assuming that there's even a tiff to begin with? Mm. Why can I not consider that the entire thing could be choreographed? Because the leading lights who seem to be championing this perspective that is causing the hoo-ha mm. are in Jubilee. Yes, all of them. Now, when you say Jubilee, tongue-in-cheek, you say, who's Jubilee? Mm. But they're in Jubilee. Mm -hmm. So, the moment that comes in, and I have to ask, um, what really am I seeing here? Consider for a single second. Mm. Something would be a little more credible if you allow a little debate on it. Mm. All right. Remember, the fact that we keep having our focus shifted towards the, what's happening in the Senate, it doesn't mean other things that are supposed to happen in the country oh, no. are not happening. No, they are happening. But if this takes center stage, that is the focus. Mm. So, that has been our focus. We're going to for an eighth session, are we? Ninth. Ninth. We're doing well. Yes. We're heading towards ten. Mm. Who's to say that it's again not another comp or another um, um, opportunity to show who's is bigger? And it just happens to be that the, the the Senate floor is the platform upon which this can happen. Perfect timing because at this time you should be debating over who gets allocation. So here's another opportunity for the push and pull. It was a by-election uh, last year. It was um, removal of of those who didn't um, toe the line in a certain direction. And now here it is. It's county allocation pitting one person against the other. But there are things that are happening behind the screen. As far as I'm concerned, because these are politicians, mm. I would argue that there is something else that even as this matter is reported on eh, on a daily basis, there's something that we are not being told. There's something else cooking. There's something else cooking. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's not just because... It's not necessarily a Tanga Tanga Kieleweke fight, no, by the way. Because no. you can find that you there are Tanga Tanga it people isn't. who are strongly and vehemently yeah. for the formula, for the as, formula. As, mm. as, yes. as it's presented. Yes. And then there are those who are completely against it. Yes. And there are those who are Kieleweke who are the same. It's like this debate has formed, should we say, a new body within Senate. Mm. It's like a new political party within a new, Senate. Uh, a new, yes. yes. Th that has collected from all the parties. Some coalition Senate. of sorts. Exactly. Right. So this is why I'm saying mm. that I'm not, I am not dismissing the idea mm. that this may very well be uh, something very decently choreographed by people who think ahead. Do you Let, think these mm. guys are also aware that they are are they part of the choreography or are they unaware they are. that they're just puppets? They are. You think they went in blind? They are. This 24, you think all of them are in the same, reading the same script? I believe at but some point... We are doing this how to many, distract. Let's start with how many senators do we have? 47. Precisely. Well, so, 47 delegations. Exactly. Boards, mm. So essentially what we're saying is about half mm. the number? Yeah. Mm? It's possible. That it's all right. of them know? It's very, very possible. 
47 is a small number. And 28, 4 is an even smaller number. Some of them would go out blurting out and saying what's happening. Uh, yes, They'll they forget. would. But you see, when you have so much going on, who will believe you? Which is the more believable narrative? The narrative that seems to hold sway here, the narrative that this thing is going to disadvantage some people mm. and we are fighting against it. Mm. That narrative means here are people who've decided that they want to present themselves as the champions of the people's interest. Yeah. All right? And yep. in so doing, paint the other party as the naysayers. Mm. These are the people who want the status quo to be maintained at the cost of the livelihood of, of. the common monainji. Mm. And then there are those who want to give us the impression that they are being reasonable and sensible and balanced about it. Politicians. Yeah. <laughs> if they wanted to have this allocation done weeks ago, nine weeks ago, if they wanted to have had this done really nine weeks ago, it would have been done. <laughs> 28 minutes to 7 o'clock. Let's take a look at what's happening on the roads and then we continue looking at other headlines of the day. Good morning. Traffic. Okay, so there was a terrible accident on Thicker Road last night, um, uh, right around Del Monte um, and leading towards. It uh, left some quite some damage on the road, so that's going to affect traffic inbound already this morning, and we can already see the result of that. And then further down the road this morning, quite uh, early, about 10 minutes or so ago, there was an accident right around Roy Sambo, and so that affects traffic, and we know that already. Okay, so outer ring is flowing very smoothly this Monday morning. We know that there will be quite a lot of traffic inbound from Mombasa Road today. Tis the day after the weekend. Um, Okay, so let's see what else is happening in other parts of the city. It's looking good in most parts, guys. Coming in from Thika Road to the city centre. Also coming off Mombasa Road. Not too much of drama. So far, so good. It looks good on Gong Road as well as Langata Road and coming out of Westlands as well. It hasn't built up too much. We're going to take a look at it in just a bit and see how that may have changed. Not to forget, you can let us know what you see. Spice FM KE. That's how you can reach us on Twitter. We want to know what you see and make it easy for people to move this Monday morning. Everything nice. All right. Spice, Spice up your life. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings. Four minutes to seven o'clock. We're still looking at other big stories in today's dailies. Um, what do you have, City Muga? What I have is leaders oppose leasing of Nzoya sugar, say it's a scam. <laughs> Remember the government came up with a scheme recently mm. to try and revive sugar factories in the western part of the country. Yep. 
And the understanding was that, remember there was the debate of, should they sell them, should they do what? And they said, no, no. They're heavily indebted. So yes. What said, no, do? please. Mm. Come to an understanding that. So write off the debt and then now yes. lease them to private. Yes, exactly. So mm. that at least they start on some, should we say, sound business footing. Mm -hmm. But now, uh, leaders in not just Western Kenya, but in the Bungoma area, mm have come out and said clearly, and they've been joined by Mboli Halwale saying, mm. their narrative is that the government is actually selling the sugar factories. Mm. And they say, stop selling the sugar factories at a song, for a song. Mm. Mm. Now, if you come from a um, sugar growing area, mm. you will understand that if you just stop for a moment and just halt the, 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 pol the politics around sugar, mm. and you look at what the benefits of sugar are, the truth of the matter is that the way we grow our sugar is not economical. It's not even economically viable. Mm. The smallholder, the thinking behind it, if you want to make it competitive in the world market, our sugar growing is actually not competitive. Mm. For the simple reason that the way this thing works is with economies of scale. Mm. Our neighbor right here in Sudan, next door, they have a, a sugar setup called Kanana. My goodness, just the massive acreage that has been put to that particular plant guarantees that one they'll produce it at a much lower cost because it's mechanized mm -hmm. okay whatever is produced within the sugar factory they ensure that the byproducts are also put to use mm -hmm. yeah. and by the way the byproducts of the cane are actually more valuable than the actual white sugar that we keep talking about here mm. either you can use it for fuel when i say fuel fuel for the factory itself yeah. fuel in vehicles if you produce alcohol from it and many other things that you can actually do with it. But why our sugar production is important is because it provides livelihood and it is considered a cash crop for very many small holders. Mm. But for it to actually work, government subsidy has to be considered. Has to be considered. Yes. And when I talk about subsidy, I mean the government has to give the sugar production in the country a favored status. Meaning we make it and competitive for other people to bring in their sugar. We protect it. Protect yes. It. Mm. Yeah. So the leaders from, uh, is it Mumias? It's, I don't know. Bungoma. Bungoma. So, yeah, so yeah, sugar is in, actually in the Bungoma area, yes. Uh, they, they're speaking the same language as uh, the leaders from the Greater Lake Region Economic Block come up with and said, no, 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 we want to be very much involved in this. When I hear these stories, well, um, at the back of my mind, I can't fail to look back at our Kenyanese and see that these are lucrative businesses that are about to be handed over to the private sector. Mm. And it's government leasing to the private sector. Mm. It's government leasing a factory that has basically been brought to its knees to the private sector. Actually, in many cases, I, I, Eric, it's the government leasing its factory because it's, it actually belongs it is to the government, its yeah. factory. To the private sector, right? Yes, that's what the government is doing. And there are people who may be trying to position themselves here uh, so that they can take advantage of that process. Eric, they've already positioned themselves. By the time we're talking about leasing, mm. it isn't as though that's the beginning of the conversation. It started a long time ago. That's the tail end of the conversation. Mm. And when leaders come out, it's because they understand the benefits and the profits that one can make from this. Mm. And they feel they also need to be to profit, not just in trying to champion the benefit for the Monenchi. Its own personal enemy. Yes, but also what can we as leaders benefit? Because it is clear that if this is going to happen, then we ought to have a say. Yep. Mm. Yes. So much of much of the the back and forth, the noise that we hear is from where I see it, it's politicians, political figures negotiating. They are negotiating. Like yes. So uh, a lot of political yourself, noise is just that negotiation. If, yeah. if, if you don't talk to me, I will go back to the people and tell them that this. You know, this discussion I've been reading, mm. I've been following this discussion for some time. Mm. And I, I have been hoping to read how it is the Monenchi, the small scale holder, can be involved in also owning a piece of this and in having a say. And that doesn't come up at all. I don't see it. I mean, I read and I think maybe I haven't read it right. Yeah. I, read <laughs> I look at another paper, a reporting. These leaders are not talking about organizing the people so that no. the people can form. Yes. 
for companies the, that can then go and lease from the government. Eric, uh, uh. I, Eric you, you know that the, the, the farmers are already formed. They already mm. have circles, by the mm. way. Mm. Okay, there is no government sugar factory which does not have a circle that represents the farmer. Yeah. What they've done in the past is they, they've ensured you get products, you get fertilizer, yeah. you get seedlings, and that they even come in and help you harvest. It's not that they don't exist. It's strengthening what has existed before and making sure it works so that this farmer has a say. Has a say. I don't Absolutely. hear that discussion. And this is what I, 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 I was rather hoping I would hear. This is the change that you're hoping to see because previously this was the problem that the farmers then who bore the brunt of the responsibility to produce this thing then were, were never given a voice, were never heard. They got the short end of that. Uh, All the time. This, yes. And so then you have what would be a facelift for the sugar industry but with the same ingredients. And you don't, and you don't hear a discussion change. that involves this person who does the back-breaking work yeah. to produce. You don't hear it. Yeah. And this is what you want to hear. An opportunity like this should be one where now the farmer actually has a say. A say. Remember because the, they understand the nitty-gritty of it. If you understand the, 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 the debate and the politics around cash crops in this country, it's the same discussion that coffee growers have been having. Mm. Yeah. How do I sell my coffee directly? Because I'm the one who's producing it anyway. And the reason was there's this person we refer to as a middleman who benefits more mm. than I, the actual farmer. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a debate that begins and ends with the sugar industry. It's mm. a debate okay. that should be carried on, whether it's the tea industry, whether it's it coffee, is a coffee industry. Whether it's maize. It, it's a yeah. debate because there are Kenyans who actually rely on this produce, not just for their livelihood, for, uh, for their upkeep. It is their life. It's their life. Yes. Well, but maybe it's better if it just goes to a private company and then let the private company deal with uh, farmer associations. You know, the problem because with that... Because the moment you bring it to say hmm. that um, farmers collectively then own this, you're always going to have somebody at the top. Look at the problems that we're having with KTDA. KTDA is basically owned by tea farmers. Yes, it is. But look at what has happened to KTDA over time. KTDA, the ownership has been iffy mm. in the sense that there's a time you weren't sure that it was farmers who owned it or the government who owned it. Is that not so? Mm. But with the time and with the changes, we now know it is farmers. But even as we say this, huh, I look at the development of our coffee, tea mm. now, and, sh and sugar industries. Mm. These are industries that the vagaries of climate change and what have you notwithstanding were profit-making industries. Yep. These farmers were wealthy people. Mm. They didn't need, they were genuinely wealthy. Even the small scale holder was a well to do person. Mm. They knew that their coffee or their tea or the sugar could meet their needs and beyond. And beyond. So we are not talking about something that, and it's not as though the demand suddenly went down, the no. demand had diminished. No, no, no it didn't. It so, is because of management. Yes. If you look at it, there's some element of public, right? Mm. Not private, the public. So there's no proper accountability. And the way our system has structured, the way our community, our society has basically just broken down such that management of anything that's public is not management. It is going to be mismanaged. mismanagement. Yes. This is a problem. You know, Look at, for example, the yes. farmers who grow barley and such others and they are and contracted. And what have you. And they're contracted by a private entity. You don't hear complaints. Called KBL. Yeah. Or the tobacco farmers who are contracted by the cigarette manufacturing company. Because this company is basically geared towards and it's thinking about ensuring that it maintains its supply chain, it'll deal with the farmers. Because it wants to make sure that it make it, it makes money. And they know the farmer is, is, is important, is important in, 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 in that order chain. order for them to make money, the farmer then needs to be well taken care of. Yeah. Yes. If EABL was given to government that it became a, a public institution, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, dead. So essentially, you've referred to the government as an undertaker. Ah, Yes. <laughs> 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 Counting skeletons as they go. Well, it's a quarter to seven, yeah. and then let's let's take a quick break, and then come back and look at other stories. Good morning. This is a Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation, live streaming on www.spicefm.co.ke as well as Spicefm KE Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. You can also join the conversation by um, texting us or even just sending us messages on Instagram, Spicefm KE as well. Good morning.
Spice up your life. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice FM, Nairobi. 12 minutes to 7. So, Ndu, what story do you have? So, governors seek to divorce Kemsa. They were married before, but uh, clearly they are not happy with this arrangement. The governors want the national government to allow counties to buy drugs, medical equipment and other materials from other suppliers and end the monopoly of the Kenya Medical Supplies Authority. Council of Governors Chairman Wycliffe Aparanya yesterday said the controversies and scandals that have mocked Kemsa, in, rather rocked <laughs> Kemsa in the recent weeks. Good slip that. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, um, is evidence that the agency is enjoying unwarranted monopoly. Speaking at his current home in Nairobi, Mr. Oparanya said that while the question of whether counties should be given the free will to purchase supplies outside Kemsa was still in court, it's time the agency's monopoly is ended. We should be allowed to buy from anyone as long as they are competitive. And even so, we have agencies like the Kenya Bureau of Standards, which should ensure that everything counties buy is of good quality and of the required standards. This will enable counties to adequately respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. <laughs> this w is the thing that would enable counties respond adequately if they were able to buy from other already let's no 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 when it Kemsa. comes to covid first of all mm -hmm. just for clarity and avoidance of doubt counties are buying directly from whoever they want uh -huh. when and it comes to covid this was a, a, a this was a subject of, the, of debate for some time it was actually time. declared by the president the very first time that, that we've already open, have, have a, had a conversation with the council of governors mm. and counties can now procure directly i think the issue is going forward whether they want to deal with kemsa and uh, i I, I am, I am, I am opposed to. to that. <laughs> I'm opposed to... Why are you opposed, Derek? Because I think for Kemsa, look, don't... If Kemsa was properly managed, if we managed to get rid of the cabal, say, that maybe have uh, taken stronghold of, of Kemsa, and it was properly managed, then you're talking about everything being of benefit. You know for sure that the medicine that has been procured or the medical equipment that has been procured Meet uh, standard that it's being brought, uh, you know, because of uh, what do you call it? Economies of scale. Economies of scale. Yes. So therefore, it's valuable. It's reasonably but priced. Yes. It's value for money and all those things. It makes what's the sense of 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 West Pokot County trying to procure medicine, malaria tablets from I don't know who uh, floating tenders. It's going to be more expensive. The and then the neighboring county. Wasingishu is doing the same. The neighboring county, Baringo, is doing the same. Why? When you can actually have it done through one place. The yeah. problem is that nope, I think the responsibility then of checking what has gone wrong with Kemsa and then trying to clean up the rot that is there is a responsibility that nobody wants to take on at this point. As opposed to taking the entire Kemsa and getting rid of it, because that's what you would do. If you say that counties then should buy on their own, you take away the legs, right? Mm. From this... Um, from this authority. That's what you do. You cripple it. All this sounds good if only one could believe that what these government, these politicians say is true. Is said in sincerity. It is not. It's not. They basically just want a hand in the court. Yes, they're saying, look, can we devolve what's happening in Kemsa, please? Yeah. And let's just now Those do people. it on a smaller scale. <laughs> can we just can we continue this the devolution rot? and devolve this thing nicely? <laughs> devolve this nonsense that's going Those, on against yes. and do it at the county level as well. Like, for instance, the equipment buying program, mm. okay, we got these things which we didn't need, but can we at least just get them for ourselves even if we don't need them? Mm. Mm. We don't want, say they say we don't want somebody else getting for yeah. us what we don't need. Yeah. We want to get for ourselves what we don't can need. Can we list directly? Mm. Mm. Can we be the ones that sign such deals? But isn't yes. this a mess, guys? Oh, no. I mean, you know, you raised something here, Ndu, when you mentioned getting rid of the rot. You can get rid of the rot if you want to. If you to. wanted to. Yeah. If you really wanted to. If you wanted things to flow in a seamless manner, if you wanted things to be done the right way, you can actually do it. It sounds like 
things of an no, it, of, it sounds like things of heaven, but it actually can be done here no, on earth. Remember the narrative is it's been made to appear as though it's the most difficult thing on earth. Phrase like grand corruption fights back. Yeah. Of course it does. So what? It's just corruption. This is I, one the health and the health sector corruption yeah. is one that has never been touched. Take me back to any case that's in court that involves or revolves around healthcare. Has it been resolved? We have no. issues about land, court. When there's an issue about land, court. straight court. President called a uh, press conference says half a billion acres of, uh, of land was being stolen in, in uh, Lamu, and this is what we're going to do. We see that going to court. Healthcare. Court. Uh, no. There is no case in court. There's no case. They just Precisely. discuss it and then there it disappears absolutely under the no radar. We talk about the other day, we were talking about the billions that were lost in the health ministry. Court. No case in court. <laughs> you do not hear of any arrest. You know, NYS, small matter of NYS comes up. The oh. next thing, people are arrested. There's raids in people's homes. It's public matter. People are paraded in court. Health. Have you heard of any ra Kenya pipeline, Kenya power? Have you heard of anyone who has whose home was raided at 4 a.m.? Because they were involved in some in, 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 in the Afia House or oh, procurement. Of, Not from the ministry. I mean, you hear of the, yes, like, what you hear we from hear, the agencies, yeah. NHIF. What, what we hear is they're, just NHIF. Yeah. They are transferred. Mm. Yeah, just NHIF and now Kemps are the CEO suspended. In, 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 but the corruption you know, itself, Eric, I had that these are the people. Eric, I never looked at it that way because we even have a case where mm. the people in charge of Treasury, CS, yes. Principal Secretary, arrested. 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 Out. Public glare. Cameras are there at 5 a.m. as, as hey. sleuths coming in and they're, you know, arresting this person and throwing things up in the air, you know, as, as they search for things in the house. Healthcare. Have you heard any? I had never. And you say that, that this no. particular individual, this company is, in, is associated with this and the other and they procured or they were involved in some funny and shoddy deals nope. in the health sector? No. So when you talk about it, health, you're dealing with health. Remember Forget how... Uh, Even the mess scandal is still in the throes of parliament. Yeah. It's just oh, yes. in parliament. But it hasn't gone beyond parliament. Uh, then do we have a former CS <laughs> disowning it and say, you know me, I was the CS, but you know I didn't know. Even I, I was asking was them till you wonder, hey, what on earth are we listening to here? Hmm? You're the yeah. CS. Eh? And you pre you've already presented yourself as this helpless person who didn't know and didn't understand. Yep. Then a new, another CS comes in. You're right. The scandal comes in. It's unresolved. The person is transferred. You have somebody else. Yeah. But the people themselves, those that they are, are called the mafia that operate within the corridors of Afi House, none has ever been arrested. No private individual, no company has ever been cited as this particular company. The directors of this company were involved in these shoddy deals with Afi House, and therefore that's why they are, you're finding them in court. Shoddy companies, shoddy directors, NYS, many. The Nkiritas are sitting there wondering now. Actually, Afia House, zero. You know, when you mention it, <laughs> even DOD, it, we, we get mentioned yes. and we know. So, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that is supposed to be security. security. Yeah. So you don't go around talking about it. Uh. Health. You know, nobody. Nothing. So is it cartels or is it a cartel? It's a cartel. And in this case, one should ask, who is the cartel? Because when it comes to such things... Untouchable cartel. Yes, who? Mm. Or well, somebody's twisting something somewhere. This is somebody that cannot be touched. That has to be the question that's oh, being yeah. asked. You guys will somebody come. Somebody, you make noise, all the noise you want say, to you know, make. Let me tell you, in this house here, in behind this house, here. behind and no here. no coin, no coin will go unaccounted yes. for. Uncle Nothing. Well Enter Jack Ma. <laughs> Nothing. And exit Jack Ma. Yeah. <laughs> you know we laugh because it's only it's just, it's just a way to diffuse the pressure and the tension that you feel when you talk about these things mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but the seriousness okay no. <laughs> anyway as we conclude the hour the cabinet is on leave is it mm -hmm. recess mm -hmm. yeah? for 14 working days working recess yes working leave all right days. so when it came out initially uh, there was all this word going around okay so the president has basically just disbanded his cabinet and told them you guys go home i'll call you when i need you if i need you <laughs> oh, wow. the secretary to the cabinet 
sent a head of public service released a statement yesterday explaining okay no 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 Calm down, what we're saying is that they're we, they're not going to be meeting because they're supposed to be meeting every tuesday and thursday but uh, they'll be going around the country inspecting government projects just don't forget that last month the president had issued a directive saying nobody's telling, traveling anywhere especially ministers yeah. don't go anywhere now they've been told don't don't meet go Just travel It's like Where the feet are smoke. facing forward and the head facing the other way. No, the uniqueness about this, going that huh? way. Uh. even if, I mean, the newspapers report that even in 2017 something similar happened, mm. but similar in that maybe the CSs and the P, the, the principal secretaries went on leave. Mm. Mm. But the political musical chairs were not what they are now. Mm-mm where you have this party and that party and that party playing housewarming games, okay? Mm. That hadn't happened yet. Yeah. And with the housewarming games, mm. the pointer seems to be housewarming in that you want to replace some of the employees in this house. Because that's what seems to be it. Yeah. Mm. Yes. You can't be, you can't have an agreement or you can't have an MOU without understanding what you are gaining or getting for your party. Yeah. So they have mm. reason to worry. All of them, including the CASs. They have, they have reason to worry. Okay. We are coming to the top of the hour from uh, 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock. We'll also be live on KTN Home. As we do that, CT, remind us today's proverb. Today's proverb. And make the call again to the, pub, to the audience. Well, the, the, the call was actually responded to mm-hmm. because a gentleman mm. by the name of Vasike mm. actually came up with something particularly interesting. He said mm. that the closest translation you could have to what the, 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 the proverb mentioned was, mm-hmm. yakija yapoke. Ah. Okay? And the equivalent in Kiswahili is, when a man is coming or when a person is coming towards you, you need not say, come here. When a person is coming towards you, you need not say, say come here. Yes. Why are you beckoning them forth when mm. they're already heading? They're already coming. They're already heading forth. Mm. Mm. So, Mr. Wasike, thank you. Yakija Yapoke. Yes. Any other translation that you may have in your language or in Swahili or in English, just let us know. Spice FM KE on Twitter. That's where you can tweet. Good morning. It's now 7 o'clock. Spice up your life. Okay, so has it changed? So far, so good. We're not looking at any crazy traffic situations in the city this morning. Let's take a quick look outside of Nairobi and in Mombasa. It looks pretty good. Um, slow wake up to the morning and um, getting into the town will not be too terrible as we see it now. Skip over to Kisumu and uh, well, before we get to Kisumu, looking to Eldoret, not too much traffic. Nakuru in and outbound. Um, vehicles are you know, piling up a little bit, but it won't be too crazy from what we see so far. All right, then in Kisumu, in and out of the city as well not too crazy i guess that's what we'll be using to describe a lot of traffic right now we'll see how it gets as we go along coming back into the city a little bit of a hold up then at the sgr on mombasa road and then out towards the turn off to the jkia and then through towards cabanas normal monday morning traffic out inbound from thicker road also it's piling up as we see it We'll take a look in about half an hour and see how that may change. Spice FMKE, that's how you can reach us on Twitter. Let's know what you see and let's keep it moving. This is the Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, 
Kenyan by choice, communications expert, Pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latif, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is The Situation Room. The only way to start your day. Thank you very much for tuning in to The Situation Room right here on Spice FM. Spice FM broadcasts in Nairobi on 94.4. We are in Malindi on 97.7. In Nyeri, 90.9. Eldoret, 96.7. 96.0 in Nakuru, 102.5. Kisumu, Mombasa, 87.9. We also stream this show live on www.spicefm.co.ke as well as Spice FM KE, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. And for the next two hours, we are also live on KTN Home. And I'd like to say a very good morning to our audience on KTN Home in the room. CT Muga Nduoko and Eric Latif. Let's talk about going back to the skies for Kenya Airways. Last week, we spoke to the chairman of the Kenya Airline uh, Pilots Association, Kalpa. And, you know, he was telling us what they um, think about the revival of Kenya Airways. First of all, right off the blocks, they said, they support the proposed nationalization of the airline. And then say, this is the time. If you look at what's happening around um, the world, airlines were seriously affected by COVID-19. Many of them have had to basically just uh, stop their operations completely, like Air Mauritius. Others, like South African Airways, uh, decided, you know what, we were big. We are now going to become very small. Mm-hmm. Others have had to lay, many airlines have had to lay off staff, including the big ones, the British Airways and the rest, have had to lay off very many of their members of staff. Back home, Kenya Airways decided, you know what, we also need to do something. We have lost, we have not made a shilling uh, since this pandemic began because we haven't been to the skies. Mm-hmm. And even in those cases where you've been to the skies, um, taking flowers, for example, or other commodities uh, to the export markets, we still haven't made enough money to sustain our operations. So we need to do something about this, which among the things that we need to do is cut back costs, become lean, even reduce our operations and where we are operating from. The pilots are not happy about this. They're saying this is the opportunity where you need to inject more money so that you can take advantage of everybody else who is down on their knees. Go and capture their market and operate from there. It's a big debate. It's an interesting debate. Mm. Remember, when it comes to the transportation of cargo, uh, if you look at what happened, say, for instance, with Ethiopian Airlines, Mm. and with their work within even our own boundaries, you'll find that this argument actually has traction. Mm. Because it's like it found them ready. Mm. Remember, cargo was moving. It's human beings were not moving. So anyone who had sufficient cargo planes was primed to be able to move cargo around, mm. uh, then that person still had work. Mm. They were able to. Oh, yes, they were able to. I mean, the cargo business did not stop even with COVID. It never stopped. It may have increased now mm. because maybe they've opened up sectors uh, for other sectors for business, mm. but it, 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 it never actually closed. So if you use that argument, yes, the cargo business, I think, already shone a light in that direction to show mm. that, yes, that argument is not without merit. Mm-hmm. But the t- human transportation, that one took a serious hit. Mm. And if even in the big airlines, like you're saying. Massive. I- if you talk about the airlines in, in, uh, in Europe, in America, all of them have basically just said, look, it has been seriously mm-hmm. tough. Um, it doesn't matter whether they have proper cargo operations operating, but it's just a percentage of their, of their incomes. So they were really affected by this. Yes, mm. they were. So let's speak to the CEO of Kenya Airways, and this is Alan Kilavuka. Alan, good morning. Good morning, Eric. How are you? Fine, thank you. Welcome to the Situation Room. Uh, thank you, Sana. Good morning to you all. Good morning. So, Alan, we are talking about what the airlines globally have uh, suffered and Kenya Airways is not left out, obviously. And now there's a plan that you have uh, with your management and the board to, let's say, revive Kenya Airways, bring it back to profitability. Let's start with what you have in plan now, post-COVID. What is it that you've planned to do? Yes, uh, thank you. So, so, Eric, thank you, first of all, for inviting me here this morning. 
to just clarify a few things and also to let the nation know what's going on, what we're doing, how we're faring. So, um, you know, as everybody knows, Kenya has been going through a very rough time over the last seven years uh, because of uh, uh, different things. Uh, and then early this year, in, in March, uh, when we stopped flying, when uh, there was a situation of movement in Kenya and in many parts of the world, uh, and COVID-15, uh, we stopped transporting uh, particularly passengers, uh, this situation became, became much worse. So what we did is, what, what happened is uh, our business dropped by uh, around about 90% from that point onwards for the last uh, five or so months. And uh, we did indeed continue flying cargo uh, to various destinations. But remember, cargo is also carried on the belly of the aircraft. Okay. So uh, on top of just, uh, you know, the normal cargo flight, uh, we, we also had a reduced cargo uh, capacity. Uh, we also continued flying the evacuation flights, you know, evacuating people and also bringing back Kenyans from different places who are stranded in different places. Mm. But the point is that we, we dropped the business by 90%. And uh, this, when now, the, the, the issue here is we, when you focus for the next two or three years, we see that uh, this trend will continue. Of course, uh, the numbers will improve, uh, but even judging from what you're seeing so far, since we started flying, uh, the, the numbers are not much better yeah. uh, than, than they were before. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do, therefore, is to look at our operations, look at the network, uh, look at the assets that we have, and then make sure that these things are right, uh, fit for purpose. In other words, we, we don't have uh, too big an operation that we cannot afford to run for the next two or three years. Is that In what fact, the problem uh, was before, Alan? No, no, no. The problem before was different. Mm. Uh, and and uh, it was only compounded and made worse by COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so that's, that's where we are. So what we are focusing on right now going forward is how do we make sure that the organization that we carry going forward is able to respond to the suppressed demand that we see in the marketplace? Uh, this year alone, uh, we were projecting something like uh, between 40 and 50 percent. So far, we are seeing something like 30 percent. Mm. Uh, and we, we think that these numbers are going to persist, like I said, for the next two years. Next year, we think it will probably go up to, let's say, 50 percent ish. Uh, and then uh, 2022, given the elections, it's going to still stay at 50 percent. And then we'll see a rebound in 2023, maybe 2024. Mm. That's what we are seeing. And this is not unique to Kenya. It's across the world. The, the data supports this from IATA, from the World Bank and from many other sources. So, Alan, I have to come back and ask, I mean, with Kenya Airways, even as you have said a few minutes ago, is that Kenya, um, Kenya Airways was already suffering from a problem. There was, there was whether it was hemorrhaging of, um, of, of uh, a right way to do things, for example, there was already a problem before COVID set in. What is the guarantee then? Because you're saying that, you know, over the next couple of years, there will be an increase in passengers, for example. However, coming off of the fact that there was already a problem at Kenya Airways, right? And you're saying that we'll be able to get things back on track, but that's assuming that everything is at, at status quo. Now, what guarantees do you have to show that, you know, everything will be all right, and then with the disappearance of COVID, you'll be on track? Yeah, so, so the issue here is, okay, first of all, you know, there's no business that can guarantee anything, right? Especially mm -hmm. these times when you see things like COVID happening. Nobody knew COVID was going to be there, so there's no guarantees for anything at all. But what, what there's a guarantee of one thing is that we need to make the right decisions today mm -hmm. for the long-term sustainability of the business tomorrow. So what has been plaguing Kenya Airways uh, has to do with poor liquidity, our highly leveraged position, mm. uh, high comparative costs. There are some contracts which are very rigid, which we need to work on, including some of the costs, uh, some of the contracts that we have with, uh, with the union. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also some internal inefficiencies that we need to work on. And then one of the other ones is just the over-reliance that we have on our passenger uh, revenue business. Mm. So all those things are, yes, working uh, against the airline, and there have been many attempts to address them. 
uh, in different ways. Now, what we're saying today is these issues that we are facing, this one that I've just enumerated, have been made significantly worse. Okay, so there is no way you can address them with the current size of the operation. And that's why you have to right size it so that first of all, you have a smaller issue that you can respond to. Yeah. And also the market, you see, listen, the problem here is there is absolutely no market. I mean, I've heard arguments saying that we should expand. Now, expanding where there's no market to expand to means that you're investing. Okay, so it means that you need to have a watcher to invest in a non-existing market and try and create that market, mm. which calls for a lot of money. I think uh, I have said it before that you know running an airline is no joke. You know, uh, our only just our payroll cost alone, just our payroll cost alone, is 1.2 billion a, a month. 1.2 billion a month. So that's only payroll. Mm. And other things added together, I mean, it's it's not a cheap thing to run. So if you want to invest in uh, sustaining an existing operation, it will cost you tons of actually billions of dollars for the next three years. Uh, and then you may not be able to recoup all that money. So our strategy here is shrink so that you can respond to the market that you have, yeah. the demand that's there, and then you subsequently grow from that point on. When you say that shrink, strategy. what exactly do you mean? Okay, shrink is, is basically on the operations that we have, the network that we are looking at, the assets that we have, and the staff. All right, so I That's think what st- call the st- staff will be pretty obvious and we'll discuss that a bit later. Let's start with the network and the other operations and, and the assets. Does this mean that you need to sell off some of the planes that you have or stop flying yeah, to some so, routes? Yes, so what? Let, let's start with the network because that's where it starts. Okay, so because an airline is built around a network. Mm-hmm. So what we have done is to look at uh, our entire network. Uh, we've looked at the high potential uh, routes. Those ones we will keep. We've looked at routes that will take much longer to recover. And for some of those routes, we have suspended. Uh, you know, some of them indefinitely, some for a period of time. Mm. Then we have looked at also the existing routes that we fly to. And based on demand, we have reduced the frequencies. Mm-hmm. That's why I was saying earlier, uh, we are only flying about 30% of our current network. Okay, And in fact, even that 30%, the load fa- what we call load factor, in other words, the number of people flying on the plane, mm. is still quite low compared to before. So, th- so based on that network, therefore, you look at uh, the type of operations that you're, you're running, the assets, like you said, the claims that you have, mm. and you don't need all these claims. So what we have done is we've looked at the type of aircraft that we're flying, and we've determined which ones that we think we need in the in the medium to the short to medium term for the next three years. Mm. And what we've done is we've gone back to the resource, the resource of the people who own the aircraft, and said, because of what has happened to us, could you take back this aircraft? Uh, and of course, they're not happy to do that because everybody else in the world is doing the same thing. Yep. So they will have a, a glut of aircraft sitting in their yard. Mm. So so it's a tough discussion to have with them because their penalty clause is also to return an aircraft early. Mm. Uh, but, but you know, the, we, the alternatives we have is keeping the aircraft here and keeping it on ground because there's, there's not enough demand to fly the aircraft. And still paying for it. And still pay for it. So... That, that is a tough discussion we're having right now. We also are so how many at how many uh, planes do you see um, letting go off? First of all, what's the size of our fleet? So we have the total fleet is uh, including jumbo jet is about forty six. Uh, Kenya Air alone is uh, the, the passenger aircraft is thirty four. Mm-hmm. Then we have two freighters. Mm-hmm. So. Um, Depending on the negotiations, Erica, this is a very tough and delicate uh, discussion, so mm. I'm sure some of the resources will be listening to this very keenly. So, depending on the negotiations that we have with the resources, the idea is to reduce the fleet ownership cost because it's quite high. Uh, and, and to reduce the fleet ownership cost, you have to negotiate with this resource. Either they have to allow us, if they, they, they insist to keep the aircraft, then we have to change the contract 
so that we we pay them as we fly the aircraft and not uh, you know a, not a rental number mm. not a rental figure uh, and depending on that the, the discussion if they agree to that kind of an arrangement then you can keep uh, some of the aircraft if they don't uh, then we have a difficult discussion of saying please take back your aircraft and that could be anything up to 10 of them so I hear you saying that in the beginning, when these agreements were made, it was that, you know, of course, it, it being in a rental state, is that you're going to be paying whether these aircraft are grounded or whether they're in the skies. Yeah, I mean, that is the normal uh, way to, to do what you do is okay. when, you, when you need an aircraft. You, yeah, okay. So you pay for an aircraft. Yeah. All right. So now looking at the current situation and looking how you want to go forward, I mean, obviously, before you go into um, any kind of negotiation, you maybe have an idea of how things would go. Can we ask what it looks like now? If you're going to have that conversation, does it look like something that you would be able to do? Uh, because one of the major things I know that you're dealing with as Kenya Airways is cost cutting. And this would be a major thing that would be contributory to that. Is it a possibility from where you see it now? You know, it has to be because, you know, if, if I, I mean, fleet ownership, so running an airline in itself is very expensive, like you said, so we have to cut the costs. But, but the fleet, the, the cost of the fleet is, is one of the more expensive fixed costs that we have. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's probably something like 50% of the fixed cost. Is, is this something normal in, in, the, in this industry? Yes, this is normal in the industry. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, I would say, maybe, should I say, uh, the advantage of the upper hand that we have here is that we are not the only ones asking for this kind of uh, moratorium, uh, re-renegotiating re uh, term. Mm -hmm. We're not the only ones. Mm -hmm. Everybody around the world is doing the same thing. So so it's not it's not a new thing that they're hearing. Of course, they don't like it, and of course, they will push back, and of course, they, they will say, you know, this is contractual, and therefore, you know, we'll buy, we'll abide by the contract. But, but we are thinking about different interesting discussions that we're having there. For example, uh, we need to expand the cargo space that we have. Okay. And so for some of them, the work that we need to do, we're saying to them, why don't you take uh, some of your aircraft, you know, the kind of the older ones, and convert them into freighters mm -hmm. at your cost, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, so that's a discussion that's ongoing. Now, it's not a very... Uh, interesting discussion for them because they you know typically they have a higher rental uh, figure for a passenger aircraft compared to, to a freighter to, to freighters okay so they are happier to have it as a passenger but what we're saying to them is we need freighters today mm. so if, if i was to talk about freighters for a second so kenya airways today does not have wide body freighters in other words long range uh, aircraft to carry cargo which uh, what is, traditionally what has happened for Kenya Airways is that we carry cargo on the belly of the aircraft. So if you're flying to London, you know, you carry it in the car, in the belly, yeah. uh, and that's so, for example, flowers and fruits and vegetables and so on, you carry it in the belly. Uh, and if you're going to China, same thing, US, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, what, what we are seeing is that there is a, a huge demand for cargo particularly because there's less passenger aircraft and also because uh, today, you know, there's need for movement of, of goods a lot more than we were seeing before. Mm. So there's a ramp up in demand. So indeed, it is true that we do need a wide body freighter today. Mm -hmm. So If we were to get a wide body freighter today, that would be very good for us. Uh, but what we need to do, we would need to finance it. That is, that is a secondary problem. The primary problem is to even get a freighter in the first place. Right? Because everybody else in the world, as you'd imagine, is also looking for white body freighters. Uh, and so they are not there in the market as we speak. In fact, we were checking some of the white body freighters that we would be interested in. We were seeing that the earliest one we can get is 2023, which is a little bit out there. Mm. So we now uh, try and solve the problem by looking at our white bodies. Our white bodies are the 787s, the Dreamliners, the Boeing 787s, the big ones. Huh? So we want to, because we don't need all of them, to, to, because you know there are too many of them. So we, for the for the time being, so what we have now done is to discuss with uh, for the ones that are owned by the rent, uh, the lessors, to see whether we could uh, convert them and remove the seats, 
so that you can convert those to, uh, to, to cargo, and they can increase the capacity of cargo. Uh, what we are currently doing is that we're using them with a seat on, which takes out something like 10, uh, 10 tons mm. from, from, the, from the capacity. So if you remove the seat, then you increase the tonnage by 10 tons. Yeah. So if you can do that with two of our aircraft, then again, we can find use for at least two of our, our cargo aircraft. Alan, is there an opportunity presented here to look at a different way of doing business? Um, because, I mean, uh, like you say, things happening around the world, taking on a particular form or fashion, um, is the new normal, is what is being asked. Is this an opportunity to look at maybe less passenger-reliant travel for this airline? In fact, you have spot on. Hmm. Uh, that's exactly what uh, we have to do uh, for the time being. So, so because of the patterns that we are seeing today, okay, if you look at the main categories of our demand, people who fly us, you find that uh, a large majority of them are business people flying from place to place. Another category would be tourists. Another category would be people visiting friends and relatives. Uh, so, so those are the three key categories. Of course, there are some, some here and there, but those are the three key ones. The ones that are... Uh, uh, the, high, the highest premium of them is, is the business traveler. Uh, according to our projections, according to IATA um, and uh, many of the economists, we see that uh, this business traveler will therefore have decided that they would like to um, spend, first of all, this, a lot of businesses have frozen travel, business travel. And a lot of them are saying, you know, why not use virtual meetings? Why not postpone an essential travel yeah. and so on and so forth? So a lot of that has gone down. Of course, many businesses are also saying they want to reduce their costs. And one of the first things they do is they look at the travel costs, and, and that's what is impacted. So in, in that sense, and that's what is contributing to the demand drop. Mm. But do, uh, you, do you see this demand coming back up, I mean, in terms of uh, passenger travel? I, I want you to answer this question when you come out of this uh, short commercial break so that you can tell us whether... What you're seeing now in terms of there's higher demand for cargo as opposed to passenger, if we adopt a strategy that just addresses this, is this a long-term strategy or is this just a medium-term strategy or short to medium-term strategy? And then you shall revert to the strategy to basically uh, deal with all your, star, uh, your, your passenger demand. We are speaking with Alan Kilavuka. He is a Group MD and CEO of Kenya Airways. We are talking about bringing Kenya Airways back to profitability and the strategy that the management and the board are deploying towards this. This is a Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation at 25 minutes past 7. Let's take a short break. We'll be back right here on Spice FM and KTN Home. The weather with Spice FM. It's overcast in Nairobi at 14 degrees this morning. We're looking at a high of 23 and a chance of showers later on. It's also turned to be a wet afternoon in Nyeri with highs of 21 and lows of 13. The rains are going to come down in Nakuru later with highs of 24 and lows of 13. Clear skies in Eldoret this morning will herald rain showers later and into thunderstorms with highs of 20 and lows of 12. It's 19 degrees and partly cloudy in Kisumu. Highs of 28 and lows of 19 with a wet afternoon in store. It's going to be the same in Kakamega with highs of 24 and lows of 16. It's partly cloudy in Kakamega at 17. 24 degrees in Malindi and mostly cloudy this morning. Highs of 28 and lows of 23 through the day. Showers expected later. Showers are also expected in Mombasa with highs of 28 and lows of 23. Mostly cloudy conditions at the moment. It's partly cloudy in Kampala at 19 degrees. Highs of 26 and lows of 18 with showers expected later. Dar es Salaam is a, shallow, it's a foggy morning at 23 
We'll see highs of 29 and lows of 22 and 4 degrees in Johannesburg this morning. Clear skies and sunny conditions, however, with highs of 19 and lows of 3. And finally, for now, in Lagos, it's a cloudy morning at 24, highs of 29 and lows of 23. Classic soul, R&B, smooth jazz, neo soul, and nostalgic ballads. Make some noise. Yeah. You're listening to Spice FM. Spice FM, Nakuru. All right, nasty accident at Xerian Junction this morning already, and that's going to affect traffic all the way down towards then eventually Langata Road, guys. It was really bad, and we are waiting to see if emergency services will get there. Uh, a few police on the road already to try and sort that particular issue out. Gong Road, however, is flowing very smoothly this morning. Travel safe, however, and I know the temptation to go a lot faster now that the roads are clear. But please be careful. Mombasa Road is moving along ever so slowly, not bumper to bumper just yet. It might get there in a short while, but we want to be aware of what's going on. Coming into the city from Thika Road, uh, not too bad as you get to the underpass at Pangani. You'll be fine getting into the Globe Cinema Roundabout and then into the CBD from there. It's looking good coming out of Westlands as well. So it's not too crazy this Monday morning. Let's hope it doesn't get manic. We'll check it out in a bit. Let us know also what you see. Spice of MKE, and that's on Twitter. Spice up your life. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice 28 FM. Minutes after, 29 minutes after 7 o'clock. This is The Situation Room. It's Kenya's biggest conversation. Broadcasting on Spice FM and KTN Home as well as www.spicefm.co.ke. Joining us on the line this morning is Kenya Airways Group Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer Alan Kilavuka. We are talking about reviving Kenya Airways. Before we went to the break, Alan had told us about you know the strategy that they have, which is shrink and then you'll be able to operate now and grow back in the future. And Alan, you talked about the, looking at your network, looking at um, the fleet that you have and the size of the fleet and renegotiating some of these deals that you have. Let's now come to the big one, which is the number of staff, the employees. You are planning to lay off quite a number. Let's start with how many staff does Kenya Airways employ? Okay, so Eric, uh, we have 4,600 odd uh, employees, and this is across the world mm. uh, because we, we, we are an international company. So we, we have them in our outstations, we have them in Mombasa, Kisumu, and in Nairobi. So we have about 4,800. Uh, sorry, 4,600. Yeah, employees, yeah. And then of this, how many do you hope to let go of in this immediate uh, strategy? Okay, so, so there are two things, so before I just answer that, because I want, I always like to have a logical uh, uh, discussion before getting to the number so that it's clearly understood mm. uh, what, what's happening here. So, um, first of all, in airline, the, there are two things that are critical. One is the complexity of the business. The other one is the fact that you have a very high capital intensive business and also a very high labor intensive business in other words both labor and capital are, are, are ex, extremely expensive in airline mm. so when you are when you're impacting when you're trying to right size the organization you have to impact both of them and that's why i went into great uh that's to try and explain the fact that we are reducing our assets uh, to respond to demand and therefore of course now coming to labor we, we do exactly the same thing mm -hmm. Uh, there are two key, the three key principles that we are looking at when it comes to labor. So first of all, is to make sure that all the actions that we're going to undertake during this process will be done in a transparent, dignified, and fair manner. Mm -hmm. Secondly, is uh, to, to follow a principle where you know, it's not only fair, but it is auditable. There's integrity in the process. And then there's clarity for all the actions that we take. Mm -hmm. We, we also try and make sure that we have meaningful engagement with our our staff, our social partners, and other stakeholders. Yeah. 
So we've been following those principles, and that's why we we are going methodically from one step to another. Uh, you know, Eric, this this is a very difficult process for us to to undertake because, you know, KQ first of all spends a lot of money training their staff, so it's not an easy decision to ask some of them to to leave mm-hmm. for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so of the 4,600, we had some who we had let go earlier, about 650, okay? And, and now we have another 590 who we also want to uh, to, to release. Mm. So the total number is about 1,400. But but the, the number that we are looking at is uh, the, the minimum amount of uh, employees that we, uh, we would like to release because... In the end, even these people who are releasing, what we are telling them, and we are completely sincere about this, mm. is they will be fast in line to bring them back into the organization when uh, we need them to come back. Uh, we, we do estimate that the business is dropping by 50%, but we don't want to impact uh, employees uh, for more than uh, 40%. So in other words, we just keep as many people as we possibly can. Mm to run the operation that we see will be uh, able to run with, with the number of staff that we keep. I'd like to take you back to the subject of cargo. When you say that yeah. the demand for cargo has risen, by what percentage has it risen compared to the pre-COVID period and now that we are in the COVID period? Yeah. So we, uh, cargo business, uh, so first of all, Kenya Airways as an airline, has uh, only about 10% of the cargo business, in, and that is, you know, something that, that we're working on, 10% of the business of, of cargo coming out of JKIA. Mm. Okay. So we have two things. One is what you said is expansion of uh, the cargo demand, uh, and it's difficult to tell to, to say this because we had a reduced capacity. So it's difficult to, 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 exp- to understand whether the they increase in cargo demand is because of increase in cargo demand or is it because of the decrease in capacity. Uh, but, but what we do know is that we have 10% of the business here in JKIA. What we want to do is to want to ex- expand that, mm-hmm. to increase uh, our, our, uh, our market size in our, in our home market here. And, and that's why we're working on getting extra capacity. Let me understand you. You're right? saying that of the cargo business that emanates from JKIA, we as Kenya Airways, a local airline, only have 10% of that business. Yes. How did we let that happen? <laughs> because we, we are a free market, right? Uh, JKA is a, is a free market. Mm. So we have all these airlines coming into the country. Uh, remember that uh, we have airlines, uh, some of these big uh, carriers who bring a triple seven, uh, whose belly is able to carry anything up to uh, 30 tons. Uh, okay. And they're coming every day. Uh, some of them are going to Eldred. Uh, we have big freighters coming from Europe as well, doing the same thing. And remember what I told you is that we don't have a freighter. Uh, as Kenya Airways, we don't have a white body freighter. Not, so to, to, my, on not to make too fine a point of this, but it, it appears that somewhere along the line, our planning didn't really take into account some of these matters. Because if other people were doing it, it clearly means the business existed. And we clearly did not get into it. Which brings me to my second question. Of the business that we do for ferrying passengers, what percentage of this business does local transportation of human beings comprise? Local transportation, you mean domestic? Domestic travel? Yeah, domestic travel. Yeah, that's what it's called. Domestic travel, yes. <laughs> you mean Mombasa and Kisumu? Mombasa, Kisumu, domestic, Kenya. I'm not even okay. going to East Africa, Kenya. Yeah, so, so that is uh, of our passengers, it's about 10% or so. Mm. And regional? Uh, that's not much. Okay, and regional? Re- regional would East be Africa. probably... Yeah, East Africa would probably be, if I give, uh, it's probably something like uh, 30% or so of the business. Mm. Okay. So, and then if you look at Africa-wide, that's about 50% of the business. Okay. Um, I'm looking at um, how a lot of uh, companies around the world and even countries have been able to kind of get themselves out of a situation that seemed dire. And a lot of this was through partnerships. There have been partnerships um, between government and private sector, PPPs and things like that. Is a partnership something that Kenya Airways would be 
um, looking into to be able to get itself moving. And as you think about that, um, we had conversations with the CS and the Ministry of Tourism. And this seems to be one of the ways in which you can get things off the ground. Is it something that um, Kenya Airways is forward looking into or forward thinking towards? Yes. So as, as you might know, we, we do have an existing uh, partnership with uh, KLM and uh, Air France. Uh, what we now are working on is to look at partnerships locally with local airlines. So we, we're having discussions with uh, the airlines that are here who, who are also going through a similar challenge so that we can build a proper network. Mm -hmm. Because you know, sometimes expansion is not always uh, by increasing your assets or expanding your network, but it's also expanding your partnerships. So right now we are in the middle of discussions with, uh, you know, it, it's not yet public, so we are in the middle of discussions with uh, with certain uh, airlines to see how we can partner and uh, that will build a bigger network with uh, with those uh, with those airlines. Do you have uh, an ex and, and, and help? Us. Do you have an existing mm -hmm. partnership with the hospitality industry? Uh, we do have something we call KQ uh, KQ Travel. And, and with that way, yes, we do have um, uh, KQ Holidays, sorry, actually, yeah. KQ Holidays. I mean, the KQ Holidays do have partnerships with, uh, with, with, with industry, with the tourism industry. Well, and actually, we work very closely. Okay, sorry. Sorry, no, no, please, actually, I apologize. Please, you continue. Yeah, yeah. Just, we, we do um, work very closely with KTB. So when it comes to things like uh, marketing, uh, abroad, we we do joint marketing ventures into particularly into source markets like the US and to UK. Uh, and so, apart from just having relationships with local tourist players, we also mm. have a relationship with uh, with the, with a body with a Kenya Tourism Board. Mm. I know you've mentioned uh, on more than one occasion that the airline business is actually an expensive business, but uh, around the world, we have airlines that are known to be, should we say, cheap airlines, airlines that don't charge as much. Is there a plan by Kenya Airways to increase its market share of local business, meaning make it a little more affordable for the locals? Okay. Uh, and by local business, I'm assuming you mean domestic again, right? By local business, you're right, I mean domestic. Okay. You have to remember that Kenya Airways is a group where we have a, our local carrier called JumboJet. So between JumboJet and ourselves, we want to make sure that we're covering all the market segments. Uh, so JumboJet covering uh, a certain market segment, and we also cover a certain market segment. But the overarching question I think, Muga, you're asking is, how do we make sure that um, we have a compelling uh, pricing structure for our customers. I think that's maybe the overarching question. You yeah. are you are spot on. Yeah. So and that, that and that is actually a valid uh, and legitimate uh, ask from our customers. So what to address that? What we have to do is to look at our cost base. Okay. Some of the, and when we look at cost base, we, we talk about the fixed cost, not operating cost. How do you uh, work on? I was trying to mention earlier the contract that we have with uh, our social partners and also our, uh, our the fleet owners and the stores, uh, the pro other providers, uh, providing some of our digital assets, how do we renegotiate those contracts so that they are more palatable, so that we can overall reduce the cost mm. and then pass these benefits to our customers. That's one aspect. The other aspect is just increase the efficiency of how we operate in the airline. Because we have identified some certain inefficiencies, which we can, which, you know, which we have been working on since the beginning of the year, so that we become more efficient and therefore uh, more productive, and therefore, of course, we can pass our benefit to the to the consumer. Mm. So let's talk back about this this strategy, because what you do now, Alan, is going to determine whether this airline flies or it's basically grounded. We have seen other airlines in the continent being grounded, and when you talk about the restructuring, the right sizing, as you call it, of the airline and the strategy that you have in place, then there are those uh, other naysayers, and this include the uh, pilots and the Kenya Association, I mean, the Kenya Airline Workers Union, who are saying that this is the wrong strategy. 
because um, like they argue, you cannot compete with Ethiopian, for instance, or uh, other airlines in the region. They, they have mentioned Uganda, which is expanding, they say. And yet Kenya Airways is shrinking and you still want to call yourself the pride of Africa. They say that this is the wrong strategy to take. What do you respond to that? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, this is the, the alternative strategy that uh, I have had uh, people talk about, which I kind of mentioned in passing uh, earlier, mm. saying that we should expand. Okay. Now, expanding in a market that is shrinking is a strategy that is assuming that you have uh, bottomless uh, uh, amounts of resources to be able to respond. Okay. Mm. So, so the, we, we, what we are just saying is, is, is actually quite simple, is we want to respond to the market based on research. Okay. These other airlines, are, you know, all airlines that I know are shrinking. Uh, I think you mentioned, for example, Uganda. Yep. Uh, you, 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 if you look at the fleet that Uganda has, um, uh, you know, the, the, the fleet, the only fleet that they're bringing in is the one that they had ordered earlier. Okay, so they're not expanding because of what is happening today. Mm. They are only taking uh, the, the aircraft that have, they're already ordered and paid for, by the way. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So so it's not that they're expanding because they're seeing a gap in the market. Every uh, airline that has studied the market has seen that there is a decline in, uh, in demand, and therefore they respond by right-sizing the organization mm. to meet that demand. Yeah. But if we decide today to expand, it will cost us a lot of money. Uh, and the money that we will, be, will cost us between now and 2024, when we think the rebound will happen, will not justify, the, uh, uh, it cannot be justified. We cannot justify it because we, we hope to recoup it by 2024. And like I mentioned to you earlier, you know, in airline business, it, it is a very highly capital, labor intensive business. It will cost us so much more money. And by the way, the taxpayers will pay for it. Uh, that, that it, it, will, it will not be tenable okay. going forward. And we've seen these strategies in other airlines who have tried to do that, and they've come to a, a proper. You talked about increasing efficiencies as one of the strategies you had in place. How exactly do you plan to do this? Uh, there, there are many uh, ways of doing it. Operationally, for example, is uh, how we do the in-flight service, okay? Uh, how we um, the service providers that we use in different places to make sure that we we live on time, we depart on time, and we land on time because uh, those delays cost us a lot of money in terms of penalties in uh, destination uh, uh, the, the destination airports. Mm. They cost us a lot of money when it comes to stranded air, uh, passengers when they are brought into the country because we have to uh, put them in hotels. We, we have to uh, take care of them, give them meals. So all those inefficiencies, if they build them up, they cost us uh, billions of shillings. So those are the kind of inefficiencies that we want to bring in, or that we are bring, bringing in to make sure that you know, we reduce the amount of wastage and leakage. Uh, also, just even when it comes to the way we contract, uh, how we negotiate our contracts, and so on, all those ones you know, uh, are things that will help us to become more efficient and therefore cheaper. If indeed the government takes over Kenya Airways, and if we were just, if we casually just look at our papers, one of the things that always gets our attention is this very same matter of contracting. The focus has been in the Ministry of Health and with PPEs. So how will Kenya Airways, I know this is a political question I'm asking, but I'm going to ask it nonetheless. How would Kenya Airways expect to avoid this problem if indeed it, be, it becomes a government operation. Yeah, this is a legitimate concern. Uh, when we when we were looking at the proposed uh, bill, uh, the Kenya Aviation Management Bill 2020, this is one of the things that we identified. So the attempt uh, is to is to try and do two things: to put in a governance process that will help to uh, protect the airlines from interference, okay, and do interference from outside. That is the one thing. The other thing as well is um, when it comes to contracting, for example, 
um, you know, they, they, as you know, the state corporations and, pub, and uh, public entities use the Public Procurement uh, Act to procure. Now, in aviation, it, it becomes a lot more difficult because, you, you know, because of the long, the long process of procuring. And when it comes to things like uh, aircraft being on ground, it needs a fast turnaround, a quick turnaround for you to procure some of the items. Uh, so in the bill, what has, is envisaged is that the airline, and actually indeed the entire group of operation, which is uh, Kenya, KAA, the airline, and also the aviation uh, investment company, is to come up with a policy that will help to strengthen the procurement integrity of all the three entities and will be ratified by the council of that particular entity. So, so in that way, you do two things. One, you try and shorten or short circuit the process. And also, secondly, you improve the governance of procurement and strengthen the integrity of the process. So now, um, just looking at all of this, as, as, you, as you make these plans and then moving forward and asking yourself, um, be, getting to a place where now business is viable, um, and now having taken to the skies, how is it looking? A few people, um, you know, buying tickets, flying Kenya Airways now again, and going to a few countries. How is it looking vis-a-vis -vis how it has been in the last in the last few months? Yeah, it's been a little bit uh, interesting. We, you know, we have a smaller, like you said, we have a smaller network. Mm -hmm. Now, we were hoping that this smaller network, when it comes to things like uh, the load factor that we currently have, uh, that, that the load factor would be something close to 65, hopefully 70%. Uh, on average, it's about 57%, so it's lower than we had uh, projected. Um, but what we want to do, I think one of the problems we currently have is that uh, people need to gain a lot more confidence in just generally operating, yeah. flying. Mm -hmm. So the, the work that we have cut out for us right now is to convince the passengers that it's okay, it's, it's safe to fly, but we we'll put in measures that will, will help to reduce the risk of, of, of transmission of this virus. Mm. And, and that's what we're working on right now, to see how we can help uh, uh, stimulate the market mm. and uh, gain, make passengers gain confidence in, in traveling once more. As you're doing all this, um you, you're getting a lot of, of course, support from some quarters and there's a lot of pushback from other quarters, among them your stakeholders, including the pilots whom we spoke to last week. And the pilots have really pushed back and said that, you know, what the management is doing is on its, it's what's going to bring this airline to the ground, f finally. How would you respond to all the concerns? I'm sure you even engaged with them. How would you respond to all the concerns that are being raised by the pilots? Yeah, you know, I think uh, pilots are a legitimate uh, uh, part of the fraternity in, in Kenya Airways. We have 4,600 employees, <laughs> okay? So, so they, they have a right to say what they need to say, uh, and we're listening, okay? Uh, everybody has a, an opinion in, in this matter, mm. um, and we've listened to the opinion. Now, based, again, on uh, what we have... Uh, seen in the marketplace, the research we've done, uh, the trends we are seeing today, we are convinced that our strategy is the right strategy for the long-term sustainability of the airline. You know, uh, social partners, um, or if you call them unions, yeah. their role is, is they have a, a role, and their role is to make sure that uh, they are uh, helping to retain as many jobs as possible. They also have a role to make sure that uh, they improve the terms and conditions of service of uh, their members. Mm. Okay. And we respect that role. Our role uh, as management and as part of their management, we also have a role to grow the airline, mm. to make it sustainable for the long term. So if you look at the two roles, the two roles don't conflict. It's just that the timing is, is not normally synchronized. So what we are saying today is our, our ambition is to make sure that JKIA it continues and grows to become a premium hub for both passenger and goods. Mm. Uh, and we want Kenya Airways to play a central role in that. But for us to be able to do that, we have to take care of the issues that we have today. 
because we are looking long term. Yeah. I mean, the short term is, I keep saying, the main thing for us to do, Eric, is for us to sit back and just wait for the roof to fall on our head. <laughs> but, but we can't do that. That is irresponsible. It would be, yes. Yeah, it, is, <clears throat> it is irresponsible because we, I mean, in the end, it's the taxpayer who will pay for this. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And uh, we have a duty and responsibility to our employees, mm. to our shareholders, mm. to the taxpayers, to make sure that this airline is sustainable in the long term. So have you reached out to okay. the unions and the association to have a conversation with them, to make them understand where you're coming from and also to hear where they're coming from? Yes, we, we have had several engagements with them uh, because it's a requirement by law to do to have those engagements, and we continue to have them. In fact, we have a discussion with them tomorrow, and we'll continue having those engagements. But ultimately, those engagements need to come to some sort of an agreement so that mm -hmm. we can move forward. Because the longer it takes, it brings a lot of anxiety in the in the organization. There's a lot of uh, you know. So we want to kill that anxiety, and we yeah. want to move forward. Assuming that the ultimate goal is to reduce this uh, monthly payroll of 1.2 billion shillings a month, are you open to conversations where maybe the unions or the association, even the pilots, would take a pay cut just so that they can still, all of them remain in office or in, in, uh, at, work. at work, but uh, earning less? So we, have, uh, we are open to discussions that will help to reduce the overall uh, cost structure. But it has to make the, the company efficient. In other words, the employees will need to be productive. Mm. You know, you cannot keep a big complement of staff if employees have nothing to do at the company, mm -hmm. right? If you have 50% of work and then you have 100% of employees, it means that you have a large contingent of employees yeah. not, not working. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we need to have a, an agreement uh, that, that will make that work. And, and also uh, look at, uh, you, you know, um, how can we, I, I mean, the easy thing, like I said, to do is, is just to leave it the way it is and hope that something will change. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can have an engagement that will make sense for both of them and us. But ultimately, the number of employees, we cannot keep a large contingent of employees who are not, um, don't have enough work. Okay, that will not help the organization. It will be a very um, uh, oversized organization, and it will be inefficient. And what we are looking out to come out with is a lean, efficient organization mm. that will respond to our customers and ultimately will give a return to our shareholders. Mm. Alan Kilavuka, thank you very much for speaking to us this morning, and we wish you all the best as you continue these conversations with all the stakeholders. And your plan to bring Kenya is back on its feet, or is it back to the skies? And I'd like to thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much for the engagement. Thank I hope you, to come back uh, soon. Yes, we hope to have you again soon. Asante sana. Alan Kilavuka is a Group Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of Kenya Airways. He's been telling us what the plans are for reviving this airline. Um, we know that they are laying off some stuff around 1,400. They need to look at their network. They need to right size in terms of even the routes that they are operating in, the frequency of operations in, into those routes, even the size of the fleet. Good morning. It's four minutes to eight o'clock. Let's take a quick break. We'll be back shortly. Classic soul, R&B, smooth jazz, neo soul, and nostalgic ballads. Make some noise. Yeah. You're listening to Spice FM.
Spice up your life. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4. Spice. Kenya Airways, right? I mean, looking at the kind of work that they have to do, um, the pressure, all eyes on you. Sure. I would like to see something, though, where you have a beautiful mix between an an airline that is, I mean, obviously struggling and is trying to do something to get itself back on its feet, mm. or wings in this case, and um, a, a tourism sector which is also trying to bring more people into the country that also realizes the importance of domestic tourism. Mm. So wouldn't it be fantastic if you had a mix between an airline that needed more people in its cabins and tourists, uh, a, a, a tourism sector that needed more people on the ground? That, and this spectrum could be taken from what you have available in terms of a Kenyan population. I would love to see a marriage like that. I'd like to see a marriage that also includes a plan to ensure that the mistakes that were made in the past that landed them in the jam they were in long before COVID mm. are mm. not repeated again. Mm. I because think that's crucial. That's where the focus should be. It's the corporate management, uh, and, and this is where the board needs to really know that what it has one job, to regain trust. Mm. The trust of the public, the trust of the investors, the trust of the government, and everybody who's involved in uh, this uh, airline business. Mm. You need to regain trust. Yes. Because we are at a point where whenever you hear Kenya Airways saying, you know, we need some money, we need to think, ah, again. But you can see that there's some effort heading towards that. When, when um, you know, they talk of someone like the way Alan is saying, this, this is something we must do and we've got to do. You know, the, the situation that this gentleman finds himself in is a really an enviable one. Mm. It is difficult. It's a tough one. Because there are all these problems that were there before which were not resolved. Mm. Then the COVID is brought about by COVID. Then now there's just the reality of the industry and what needs to be done. And with the reality of the resources you have, ah. Tough one. No, this is a tough one. It's eight o'clock. Let's take a look at what's happening on the roads and then we will begin with today's proverb from CT Muga as we switch gears into another conversation. Good morning. 102.5 Spice FM Kisumu All right, eyes out of Nairobi traffic. now. There's a crazy traffic jam in Mombasa, Makupa Causeway, Kibrarani to Shell Changamwe. There's total chaos there this morning. Not sure why quite right now what the cause of it is but just if you're headed or leaving in that direction and you're stuck so you understand from makupa causeway to kibarani and the shell at, at the shell in changamwe in mombasa total chaos this morning so if you're heading in that direction you need to be aware of what lies ahead all right let's come back into nairobi we're on mombasa road yes it has fallen into what we expect in terms of traffic this morning all the way from the sgr even before that in Mulongo and then towards the JKIA turnoff and then towards Cabanas. That is bumper to bumper. There was a terrible accident on, at the Kisarian Junction this morning and so that affects traffic all the way com coming all the way down and then towards Langata Road and it's snaking along then towards the Timor roundabout. So that's what we're facing this Monday morning outbound on Thicker Road also some traffic inbound, a lot more traffic as you're trying to get into the CBD via the Globe Cinema roundabout. So it's a manic Monday. We expected this to happen so we have to now pepper all of this with a little bit of patience. Spice of MKE, let us know what you see. At least make it easier for one person to get through. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, 
controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, Pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the Situation Room, the only way to Good start morning, your how day. are you, wherever you are, this very beautiful Monday morning, the 17th day of August, 2020, at three minutes after eight o'clock, this is the Situation Room. It's Kenya's biggest conversation, broadcasting on Spice FM and KTN Home. Let's begin the hour with today's proverb, C.T. Muga. When a person is coming towards you, you need not say, come here. They're coming anyway. That's the general idea. They were already heading in your direction. Mm -hmm. And it isn't as though words uttered by you will either forestall or will encourage their onward journey. They were heading in that direction anyway. All right. Mm -hmm. And we're asking you to tell us if you have any close translation of this proverb in uh, your local language. And let us know. Spice FM KE on Twitter. You remember the one that uh, we had gotten from uh, Jeremiah Wasike who had yes. said, in Swahili, the closest is he thinks of is Yakija Yapoke. Yes. And we thank him for that. Yakija Yapoke. Mm. What is it that you'd think of closer to you or in Swahili or any other language? Spice FM KE on Twitter. Let's shift gears now and talk about COVID-19. We are fighting COVID-19 uh, in this country. The country has received a lot of support, both internally and externally, to the fight against COVID-19. Internally, through this one fund, called the COVID-19 Emergency Response Fund, and then externally through various org or, um, organs, okay, coming directly to the National Treasury as budgetary support from uh, the multilateral lenders, coming from other support uh, development partners like the European Union, uh, pouring in money directly into communities to help in the fight against COVID-19, coming from individuals like Jack Ma and the Jack Ma Foundation, the Clinton Foundation, all those that have donated into this. Then, every now and then, we keep raising the question of, okay, can we, is there accountability for this? Have we seen where this money has gone to? Have we seen where the donations that we've received in kind have gone to? Questions have been asked about the PPEs. A <laughs> question have been asked even about the hand sanitizers that were donated by the government itself, mm. you know, by uh, making hand sanitizer to be di distributed around the country. A story that was aired on NTV yesterday, um, COVID millionaires. It also looks at other stories that have been covered all over the media, even on this particular show. We've asked these very, very same questions. Mm -hmm. Where is the money? Martha Karua, whom we spoke to last week, was asking the same question. So where is the money? Why is it that, you know, we only have so many questions and uh, not an equivalent number of answers. Yeah, I know. It's exhausting when you think about it already because you want to ask yourself and say, why is it that we continue to uh, run around in this rat race and there seems to be no finish line? There seems to be no crossing where you can say, all right, this we left behind and we didn't have to deal with that drama before. So... This money has not trickled in. This money has come in the droves. It has come. A lot of money has come in. Money that would be able to tilt an economy um, in a very positive way. In, mm. in, in leaps and bounds, it would have been able to do a lot more with it. But I would like to stay away from the sensationalism of billions of shillings having disappeared and go to the nitty-gritty, which I believe everybody should be asking, who was responsible for what? When money came in, when donations came in, who was supposed to be the custodians of this thing and make sure that they actually reached the adequate place? So that if in, in fact something was circumvented or somebody came with this brilliant plan for circumvention, who was the person that opened the door or rather who was the person that left the key for somebody to then be able to come and pick it up and open and do whatever they needed to do. Because then if we don't have any kind of accountability, this thing, it's not, nothing is going to happen. We're going to hear the song and dance, horse and pony shows. Uh, what is it? 
dog and horse, pony and dog. Show. <laughs> One of those animals. You pick it's them. just you anyone you, you just like. You keep mentioning them mm. so you, that you give people the options. Canary and chicken. Uh, Let's go. That's it, uh, yes. Canary how they, and how chicken. How they'd like to mix and match. Yes. 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 Mm. It's dog and pony. Dog actually. and pony yes. is what I was looking for. Mm. It's just going to continue. So we're just going to be, t- it, it'll be a billion today. It'll be 10 billion tomorrow because guess what? COVID will come and go. Then there'll be something else next year. And a, an opportunity will present itself for somebody else to steal. Okay? Because we, we want to. You're operating on the premise that it's been stolen. Call it what you want to do. Dress it up. Now, if you wanted Dress to get it into the nitty gritties, do you have the nitty gritty that actually shows that this was stolen? No. If you want to say that money came in, mm. right, and you can't see evidence of how it was used. And it doesn't exist. And it doesn't, that thing that what you're saying, exist? the money was the supposed money, to be done. That money. Though the money is not there, the thing that it was supposed to have done, you can't see evidence of such. What do you then? Though the Treasury would disagree with you, because yeah. last week, the Treasury was reported to have said that actually, Speaking, this money actually hasn't been used. You know, the what makes this discussion, in my opinion, potent is mm. because already, if we look at if we look at what the figures at Oxfam and World Bank have actually put out, they said worst case scenario with this COVID thing, close to half a billion people will end up in poverty. People who are previously not poor, mm. and the poverty line, according to them, is people who are less than five point five dollars a day mm. okay that's the poverty line and they say that is where we're headed now when you read about monies that have come in and eric you asked the question so let me try and answer it mm. the ppes that supposedly came in and all the other equipment that was supposed to help us in this fight normally in this country when such things are given there's a big song and dance when they're being handed over huge pictures what have you? Have you seen any pictures of those things being handed over? The answer is no. What we've read of, though, is our local capacity being revamped, increased, expanded. Now, when there is so much silence about the direction, the manner in which, something which was so clearly given to us, the, where it landed or where it ended up, then one has absolute license to, Im- to let the imagination go wild as to what could have happened. That. Especially also added to that, the absence of any kind of an explanation hitherto. Nobody says very clearly, okay, this is what you have clear, that this is what it was used for. And so you don't leave rooms for speculation. But if in the absence of that, anybody is able to guess or imagine whatever they want at this point. You also get the impression that there are people who are supposed to be in charge of this entire operation who don't seem to think or feel they need to explain anything to anybody. It came in. There's no explanation. And what about the explanation? There's no explanation. And that's the end of that particular story. So, one cannot be blamed if they let their imagination go completely wild on this particular matter. But it isn't really wild. That particular ministry, unfortunately, has been bedeviled by scandals of enormous proportions over the years. And a lot of that has had to do with money that have come into that ministry from friendly donors to help us with various problems at various times. And yet the money has gone, and no less uh, an institution than the Auditor General's office are the ones who came up with some of the huge figures, like $5 billion. Mm. Now, the Auditor General's query, it was an audit query, $5 billion had been spent. But um, on what specifically seemed to have been an issue? So we have the same issue now again. A donation was given. We Twice. know it arrived in this, yes. We know other donations have been given. But every time you ask for a specific account of how this money has been used, even when the money was taken to counties by our government, and these same questions were asked, in some counties you'd be told who actually procured it, in some you'd be told amounts, in others there'd be gaps. But the truth is, there was a lot of gray areas in this matter of monies that were supposed to be spent on COVID-related issues. Our very own Dr. Marcy Koriri, she's um, KTN's medical journalist and the group's uh, medical editor, joins us on the line. Marcy, you have covered this story. You have gone to the press conferences addressed by the CSAs, even addressed by the PS and the CSAs, and you've asked these questions. And what kind of answers have you been getting? Um, well, and luckily you guys have been um, 
witnesses <laughs> that we have been getting short stories, what I call short stories. Yeah. You know, um, answers that are neither here nor there. Because I remember at the very beginning um, when we were covering this and immediately after the World Bank uh, approved about 50 million Kenya shillings, um, no, 50 million U.S. dollars, which is about 5 billion, mm -hmm. uh, to go into the COVID response, where 1 billion of that was supposed to go into the blood crisis yeah. and 4 billion to the COVID response. And, and, and the World Bank document really had broken down where what money was supposed to go. So including PPEs, including testing, to so the whole list, capacity building and uh, improvement of facilities. Mm. So the money was was approved, but then from from the sources on the ground and the healthcare workers on the ground, they're like, we do not have any PPEs, we are exposed. Then you ask the Ministry of Health, okay, so what's happening? If you have the money for PPEs, really, why are your frontline healthcare workers, including those in isolation units, not covered at all? Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the conversation was, you know, we have received this, I think that was about the time also when Jack Ma donation was in, mm. that they are working on distribution on a needs basis. Then another time I had conversations with the WHO country representative about PPEs, and he told me the ministry had told him they were in the high seas. So I asked the ministry, they're like, you know, they're on the way, they haven't arrived. I don't know, issues of cargo, delays of shipping, you know, all of those things yeah. that had been affected by COVID. Mm. Um, then after that, there's a time I asked the CS and he was like, you know, in the next two weeks, no healthcare worker will have any complaints about PPEs. Two weeks came and went, it became a month. People still do not have PPEs. But then now when you ask on the ground, people do not have PPEs. They have to reuse um, some of the masks that they have, like the N95 masks. Um, what they were buying before for 500 shillings, for example, uh, now they are buying for 5,000 shillings because things had astronomically, yeah. you know, risen. So you could see all of these things, they were not making sense at the time. Yeah, and now we can see why it wasn't making sense. While we were genuinely trying to help the country come to terms with COVID-19, uh, bring out the information, help people try and bridge the gap. Mm. Clearly, there are other people who are planning a heist. But I think we still have very many gaps uh, because the stories that we keep uh, hearing, watching and reading are uh, pointing fingers somewhere, but not necessarily <coughs> placing a finger on somebody's forehead and saying that this is the person who has... Uh, you know, taken away what was supposed to have gone to other people, the the public. We still have very many gaps, Marcy. We still do not know, for example, the Jack Ma donation, we are still operating on the insinuation that the Jack Ma donation disappeared. We don't have any evidence to actually show that the Jack Ma donation left China X number of units, arrived at JKIA X number of units, and then distributed X minus 50,000 50, units. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Eric, like I'm, I'm in possession of uh, the distribution list eh, mm -hmm. of what was supposed to, of, of what arrived and what was supposed to be distributed. So, where the the trail ends is who received, hmm. because there's no indication of who is on the of that of that um, donation list. Mm -hmm. So, for me, it is up to the National Emergency Response Committee chaired by the CS of Health, to come out, you know, as Ndu said, and say clearly, this is what we received, this is what we gave so-and-so. Just come out and say, you know, and clear the air so that we do not have all of these questions and speculations. So what you're saying that you have day, so far, sorry to cut you short, is that you've got, mm -hmm. like, the manifest. You know how much left China? No, 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 no. How much we received. How much arrived how at, much J how much arrived at JKIA? Yes. So how much and, are and, what, and, and uh, I do not have that list with me here and, and, and where it was and time. where it was meant to go. And, yes, and where it was meant to go. So whether it went or were received mm. is what we do not have. But have there been any question asked to the people who were supposed to receive? Like, 
you are supposed to have received, let's say an institution, Kenyatta National Hospital, you are supposed to have received 200,000 uh, face masks. Did you receive 200,000 face masks? Well, what the people on the ground are saying is that they have a shortage of PPEs. Are we then suggesting that the donation from this particular foundation was to, supposed to, at, at some point over a period of time, resolve these matters of PPEs to the point where every public institution would say that they have adequate supplies of PPEs? Um, not every public institution, but at the time when they were coming in, the main isolation units were supposed to be covered and the high risk, we had 14 high risk counties. So at the very least, those ones are supposed to be covered. Mm. And the other, what was also on the on on the list or what was said by the ministry was they would distribute also on a needs basis. Yeah. So that um, if county X needs, then they are, they are given. And at the time... Um, the, the outbreak was limited to Nairobi. Mm. So you'd have expected that your public facilities in Nairobi are covered. But that is the time, remember, we had um, healthcare workers transmitting the virus to communities. And I remember we did that chain of transmission from one of the healthcare workers to Kawangware. And you could only assume yeah. that it's from a lack of PPEs because this was a healthcare worker who was um, right in the front line the working COVID at the uh, ministry. Exactly. Yes. exactly. And this was the time when it was limited to Nairobi. So you can't say that it is like now where the spread of the disease is, is, is intense. There is intense community outbreak all over the country. But let me ask this question, Mercy. Is it possible to know uh, the quantities of uh, PPEs that actually left China? So remember the Jack Ma donations, eh? mm. both both rounds, they actually posted on their on their Twitter account, and they gave a press release. So these donations were going to the AU, mm. that is in um, Ethiopia, and then from there, actually Ethiopian Airlines was supposed to distribute to all 52 African countries. Yeah. So it was just broken down equally to all the African countries. And we have pictures of our donations coming into JKI. Mm. Mm. Yes. We have them. We have the pictures of these donations mm. arriving at JKI. But also there's yeah. also information of, like you've said, they were supposed to go to Ethiopia, and then from Ethiopia they're distributed to several other countries. Yeah. Uh, Eric, what we have are pictures of a certain pallet with certain items on it, an individual standing next to a plane, <laughs> and we were told these are the Jack no, no, Ma no. donations. It's no, Mercy but has a yeah, list of we, the inventory. Actually, of the inventory. Yes, and we actually even fact-checked that consignment because mm. we were able to to check uh, from the pictures and what was there to mm. fact-check back then to see if it was actually from the Jack Ma Foundation and Alibaba Foundation and it was actually the right one. Mm. Things disappear yeah. from JK. Remember even there's a German consignment that disappeared. <laughs> I wasn't meant to come here. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's. <laughs> Are you likening JK to the Bermuda Triangle? <laughs> 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 Just yes, looking at what's going on. I mean, through all of this, uh, what what would it mean, uh, Mercy? As we're looking at this and saying, what would it mean that money or donations that were meant to be used for certain things. And I think for us to mm -hmm. accept the gravity of such a possibility, we should be able to understand what the money would have been able to do or what the donations would have been able to help with. Can you give us a bit of an eye into that? If we look around the country now and we look at threats mm -hmm. by nurses to go on strike, by doctors mm -hmm. to go on strike and other health mm -hmm. workers to go on strike, what could mm -hmm. these donations actually do vis-a-vis -vis what we're actually seeing today? So let, let me pick out two things that um, probably Kenyans would clearly understand. Mm. One of them is the issue of PPE, and the other one is on testing. So on PPE, for example, um, you are talking about masks, N95, and good quality surgical masks for your healthcare workers, good gloves, and eye shields, 
at the very least, forget even the hazmat suits and the surgical gowns, at the very least, items that would protect your mouth and nose and your eyes and your hands because you're attending to people. So in the event that um, you do not have good quality items, one, or you do not have any of these items, it means that person you're attending to, you do not know their status. If they have COVID-19, you will pick it as a healthcare worker. Mm. Remember, we, we even covered this where the ministry was supposed to house healthcare workers um, working in the isolation units at the very beginning so that they limit transmission yeah. uh, because they would use matatus to go home. They would interact with their family members over the weekend. They would go to the markets. So they were supposed to be in in certain um, accommodation to limit this. Mm. So you do not have good quality PPEs or enough PPEs. Mm. You're still going home. If you pick that virus in the course of your duty, one is that you will spread it, obviously, because you do not know that you have it. Or by the time you are finding out that you have it, it's already some days and you have contacted or come in contact with several people. Two, healthcare workers, I think now we are almost at a thousand, if not a thousand, mm. have contracted the disease. We have lost doctors, nurses, and clinical officers to the disease. These are breadwinners. These are mothers, fathers. You know, they are somebody's children. Yeah. But we have lost them to the disease. Yet, had we protected them, these are lives that you would have saved. We're talking, about the, we're talking about the, okay. the who, what, why, where of the COVID-19. Speaking with us on the line is Dr. Marcy Kareer, KTN's medical journalist. In the room is Siti Muga Ndu Okona, Eric Latif. This is a situation room. It's Kenya's biggest conversation. Time to take a quick break and then we'll be back. This is on Spice FM and KTN Home at 24 minutes after 8. One hundred two point five Spice FM, Kisumu. A mostly overcast morning in Nairobi at 14 degrees. Still a little bit chilly for Nairobi standards. Highs of 23 and lows of 13 today. And there's also a chance of a sprinkle later on. Where it's already happening in Yeri at 14 degrees. Rain is expected to last for most parts of today. Highs of 21 and lows of 13. It's mostly cloudy in Nakuru at 14 degrees. Highs of 23 and lows of 12. And likely to be a wet afternoon here. Thunderstorms will overtake the afternoon in Eldoret with highs of 20 and lows of 12. Where it's mostly cloudy at 15 minutes at 15 degrees at the moment. It's partly cloudy in Kisumu at 20, highs of 28 and lows of 19 with showers expected later. Kakamega, it's going to be a wet afternoon as well with highs of 24 and lows of 16 with showers lasting throughout the afternoon. Malindi is partly cloudy at 24 degrees, highs of 28 and lows of 23 and in Mombasa, it's partly cloudy conditions at 24 degrees with highs of 28. Kampala is going to be partly cloudy this morning at 20, leading into a showery afternoon with highs of 26 and lows of 19. Shallow fog is what is dealt over the city of over the town of Dar es Salaam this morning, highs of 30 and lows of 22. Johannesburg is mostly sunny at 4 degrees this morning. Highs of 19 and lows of 3. And finally for now, in Lagos, it's a cloudy morning at 24. The sun will peek through those clouds later though with highs of 29 and lows of 23. Mellow Spice ever so slowly on the stretch from Survey to Mathaiga on Thicker Road this morning. It's not bumper to bumper situation yet but it's moving. As you get then to the Pangani underpass you should be fine as traffic joins from Kiambu Road and um, um, 
Muthaiga Corner. All right, so let's look at other parts now. It's tight on the escarpment at Maimahu as we're handing out of Nairobi. Um, the, the visibility is low, but there's traffic and it's snaking along for almost three kilometers this morning. And this is outbound from the city. Be extra careful, folks, because the weather is contributing to moving very slowly. If we go back to Maimahu for a minute there, it's both directions, right? In and outbound, the traffic is very, very heavy. We'll take a look at how that opens up in a short while. Spice of MKE, also let us know what you see. Spice up your life. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Right. 94.4 Spice FM, Nairobi. Every penny of the COVID-19 billions. That's what we're discussing this hour in the Situation Room this morning. Ndu Oko, C.T. Muga, Eric Latif. And joining us on the line is KTN's medical journalist, Dr. Mercy Correer. So we were talking about, you know, the uh, this is what could have happened if all of these donations basically were put into good use. Hmm. But do we know mm -hmm. that they are not put into good use? This I keep going back to that question. Do we actually have anything that we can stand up and say? Actually, what we're dealing with here is a very straightforward case. Mm. Guilty until proven innocent. <laughs> if, sure. this, if, 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 if we didn't have a history of many things that ought to have gone right, going wrong mm. in the Ministry of Health, mm. this discussion would have been perhaps differently slanted. But because of that history... Yeah. Unfortunately, and because the promises, remember promises were made, it started with making sure there is facilities where people can actually go should they need to be hospitalized. Remember? Yep. Mm -hmm. And went back and forth. Do you know where it is? You couldn't find it. The story went on and on and on. And we took the view, we'll believe it when we see it. Mm -hmm. All right? I'm going back to factory settings. When I am shown a list of how these PPEs were distributed, and we can verify with the places that have been claimed to have received them, then clearly I will believe. So we operate on that mantra, assume fraud unless genius is proven. Yes, because this is the way in which it has carried out itself before. <laughs> you yourself told us less than an hour ago about mm. how this mafia house, <laughs> right? Things have happened in mafia house, but never has a case been taken to court. The closest we've seen was anything related to that was NHIF, right? Where a couple of bosses lost their jobs, arrested, and then arraigned in court. But ministry direct? But ministry directly hasn't happened. Kemsa, we keep seeing all the time. Seen, the closest we've seen again mm. is um, the mess scandal, which is in parliament. They keep discussing here and there. This happened, this didn't happen. I didn't have the mandate i did have the mandate i wasn't secretary at that point it was somebody else that's the closest that we have seen however we continue to see scandal after scandal after scandal okay let's not even call it scandal questions keep popping up mushrooming here and there don't you think that by the time these questions continue to come even if there are allegations or suspicions of something shouldn't it ginger people up a little bit to be able to say, okay, here, there's something wrong. So I would go with that until and unless you're able to say, actually, you know what? Here it is. Down to the shilling that was spent. Mm. Down to the individuals that were helped. Down to the N95 masks that Dr. Curry is talking about this morning, which cannot be found. Until and unless that is proven, then I'm going to be of the speculation that the money is in the pockets of people, that the, the equipment that was donated has been sold again for profit by a few unscrupulous individuals. I am going to assume that until you're able to prove differently because of the fact that previously things have happened what would the that issue have here not be? That been given that any that kind that of the, the integrity. The PPEs to. are stolen and then they are, what, they are sold, sold to the market elsewhere. to everybody else hmm? or sold to another government or sold to the same sold. government? Sold. Sold. Meaning they didn't end up where they were. They were purpose. donations. Donations means that you don't take it and then use it for profit. Look at it's what, a donation mm. to help you fight the disease. It's not a donation to you <laughs> to sell so that you can make money. That's not the point. Remember what Dr. Mercy mentioned. Huh? Mm. You have healthcare workers who are in need of these very, very donations and they don't have them. So what is clear, the donations didn't get to where they were intended. They didn't. So where did the donations go? 
Now that That's is because you see here's the thing. You're talking about the same country. So if you saw if you told me that you went to other private uh, facilities and you saw people wearing this uh, N95 mask you'd be like hmm I can see that. But no Eric oh. the the private facilities I think here we need to separate between the public and the private. Eh? Mm -hmm. When the donations come into the country the priority is the public facilities because remember your public facilities are 10 to 60% of the population yep so your priority is your public facilities the private facilities have their own procurement channels they have a way they procure and process their own things mm -hmm. so you'd assume or rather not even assume what they do and they have been doing is to get their own uh, PPEs and some even had uh, some of these PPEs even before the pandemic because as as you would expect if you know that it is not a matter of if this pandemic will be here but when it will be most of them are actually prepared. planned and 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 prepare to have those PPEs yeah. but for the government what you were doing uh, was just a bit of trying to see uh, meetings boardroom meetings the, the, um, the developing documents here and there and hoping that it doesn't get so when it got here it got us flat-footed. And one of the questions that we've been asking is, okay, fine, we may have been caught by surprise or you guys didn't think it was coming. But even before the, the virus got here, uh, as a ministry or as KEMSA, you still had some people. It's not like we did not have any mm. at all because we, we have been managing other high-risk diseases anyway as a country. So it's not like they, did not, they had zero. They had some. But when we announced the first case, it's like we did not have any of those PPEs. No, they were unavailable. They were, they were either unavailable or inadequate. So now this is where the donations started coming in, the issues of procuring to get more PPEs, because now you're trying to, to plan because yep. you think this disease is going to, uh, to spread. Yep. So the private facilities are their own ways, but the donations were primary for your pub public I am facilities. not even raising an and issue about the private facilities, Marcy. I think you, you, you maybe got me wrong here. I'm raising issues about the gaps in how even the story is coming out to the public. We are very good at identifying that this is a source of a donation. We are very good at tracking until it arrives at JKIA. We are even very good at insinuating who it is that could have stolen the, what was meant to be a donation. But then it ends there. Where did it end up? Can we say that this... PPEs that were stolen then ended up being sold in supermarkets or in from private warehouses okay. or from private vehicles to individuals like CT and I, or did they go to some <laughs> small uh, hospitals that were not able to procure from abroad? Were they sold to other countries? Were they sold to the same government? How come we have that gap? So those, are, so those are the questions we are trying to find out and follow up and see where the trail ends. This, this is, is what you call a developing story. Absolutely. And look, we may not want to look at it, but the fact that you have to ask a question about where things is such multitude went and that the, you are greeted with such deafening silence is the problem. Look, not very, it's the long, problem. Not very long ago, mm. long before even COVID, the debate that engulfed us was that of blood, the donation, and the where to fall regarding it. And it was back and forth. You see, if we're dealing with an institution that has just one or two scandals in a year, mm. and then at some point they responded to, so you at least you have an idea of what happened, the debate wouldn't be what it is. But this is one ministry that seems to thrive in generating scandals. Just even before you can take breath, you, you can sort of like breathe from the previous scandal, another one arrives at you. And why do we call it a scandal? It's because it involves money. It involves human lives. It involves something which ordinarily should be straightforward. Donation given, donation arrives, donation reaches destination. And used, and then for thereafter used. Yes, but this one, it comes, it gets to JKIA. End of story. End of story. Okay, that is one side of things. And then there's the other, the other side of things, which is raising questions around procurement and the Kenya Medical Supplies Authority, where now the ESCC has landed there and they're conducting investigations, mm -hmm. which is also another story that has been covered. And mm -hmm. the questions that keep emerging here are um, how the procurement was done and uh, how much the companies that were identified 
to procure to supply or quoting vis-a-vis -vis how much it was costing in the market is there a, a story here Marcy? There is, there is a big story there. Um, and from the Senate ad hoc committee, when they compared the pricing from, from KEMSA mm. and what the market was, KEMSA was, was costly. <laughs> and you would expect, because they have the economies of scale, they are supplying everyone in the country, that you would have a, a way, way lower price, which is competitive. And it's not just about the PPEs, even the medicines that they, that they supply to the counties and uh, health, public health facilities. When you compare the pricing in KEMSA and that of what is in the market, mm. then you would find there's, there's a huge gap. So the question that um, some of the facility managers and what the counties have been asking is, um, if KEMSA is supposed to supply to be the sole supplier of public health facilities, then why is it more costly than what is in the market? And that raises a lot of questions because what this does at the end of the day is make healthcare uh, less affordable for we, the Mwanainchi who are looking for health services. Because you remember at the end of the day, somebody has to foot this bill one way or another. Mm. So you'll find that your NHIF, even if you're using it, gets exhausted. So you have to foot this bill. Yet, you would expect that this um, this agency supplying everyone in the country would have very low prices to make healthcare a little bit affordable. So it's not just about the PPEs. I think uh, what COVID has done, and we have kept staying, is um, it, it will show the best and the worst in us. So I think what COVID is doing, thankfully for us, is just to unmask what has been happening behind KEMSA and how the Mwanainchi keeps losing at the end of the day. Because at all, after all of this, yes, people will pocket these monies, but the person who will suffer is you and I. You know, the even as Eric raises these questions and he should and he's right, remember, it, there's a saying, give a dog a bad name and hang it. <laughs> you see, th 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 this particular ministry cannot be hanged enough. It, it, it seems to have a reputation for its capacity to mismanage the healthcare needs of this country. That is the reputation it has acquired. It wasn't given. It has acquired it. And I think it has been over time because um, as, as a country, as a people, we haven't really been alive to what our health rights are. Mm. So people have been able to run amok and do as they please. And two, when public health facilities were not working and responding to our needs like uh, they were before, I remember when you were growing up, you just go to your nearest dispensary and you sorted out and you go home. But over time, when because of underfunding, mismanagement and all of these things, private health facilities, private health clinics, quacks and all manner of people mushroomed. And so when people uh, had alternatives, yep. then you sort of do not see what is happening in your public health facility. So it gives uh, people in, in, in that house, in that building, uh, sort of the license to do as they please, mm. um, to mismanage things because nobody is questioning. But now what we are seeing is that with all the conversations about health care, uh, the burdens of paying bills in hospitals and now with the pandemic where insurance companies are not paying for them, then we are asking these questions and we are right to because at the end of the day, if you do not have good health care, if you do not have the chance mm. of accessing health facilities when you need to, then your health and your life is at risk all the time and, and it's a problem because every, every Kenyan uh, right now, unless you super rich, you are at risk of being impoverished yeah. by a health care bill mm. or literally going bankrupt and finished and poor because of... Um, or even just dying because you could not access the health care exactly. services that you exactly. required. The, and exactly. I go back to what Ndu you were saying earlier, that you need now to be going into the nitty gritties, into the individuals and personalities. For a long time when you talk about Afia House, we've even branded it Mafia House, mm. we look at the minister, the PS, the minister, the PS, and then we, you know, say when those ones are moved, 
things are going to change. And yet, every new person who comes into that ministry tells you they go in and they find a system that has taken hold of this particular institution and is running it. Maybe we need to get to a point where we start asking the questions, who exactly is the Minister for Health? Because Mutahikagwe is the titular head of that mm. ministry, but then there must be another head of that ministry. What if it's just um, a story they spin to justify things going wrong? Over and over and over again? Yes. I mean, we look it's back worked at before. It keeps working. Yes. We look, oh, so, so who, who keeps spinning this tale? <coughs> You get into that particular position and you look at what's, you look at the lay of the land mm. and you realize this is, a eat. this is a believable story. Just Keep kick, your head the, down. kick the can, Eric, mm -hmm. your phrase, down the, road. down the road. Keep your head down. So you steal and you just blame it on the cartel. You don't even need to steal. Whatever it is that goes wrong, just blame it on the cartel. Or now, just ignore it. Take a nice broad spectrum of what could happen. Mm. You don't even need to steal. You could have an ostrich uh, mentality to it, bury your head in the sand so you don't know what happens. So when you ask, you didn't know. And you're the CS. Which means that there's that you went there and you found that there's something that's going on that you needed to... Why didn't you resign? Yeah, why, didn't you resign? why didn't you resign? Well, why didn't you open your mouth even at the very least and say, you know what, what I'm seeing here, I actually cannot deal with it. So that you out there must also understand that there's some rot of unbelievable proportions going on in this place. But everybody just keeps quiet. If and then later, when questions are asked, they say, well, you know, I, was I told, didn't really there know was what this. was going on and no, I was told. Come you are culpable. And you, yes, Responsibility yes, not the, being taken. It's true. Yeah. That person is culpable, <laughs> but they are, not, they are not the backbone of that corruption in that institution. There must I, be I, other I, forces I, which I you must with, unearth. Must is saying something here. Must I, I agree, yeah, I, I agree with Erica. If you look at the Uhuru administration, they've had four CSs at the very least at that ministry and several principal secretaries. That tells you something. Um, you cannot do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. So you remove Masharia, you bring in um, Mailu, you remove Mailu, you bring in Sicily, you remove Sicily, you bring in Kagwe, and you expect things to be different. Because if you look at it, um, in Uhuru's administration, Afia House has had some grand heist mm -hmm. and grand theft. Alleged, let me call them alleged grand thefts in, 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 that, in that house. And yeah. one of them is still sitting at the Senate on the managed uh, equipment services. Mm -hmm. And now we have the COVID issues. We had the um, healthcare workers issues, which actually uh, I think was, was Mailu's um, most difficult time. Yeah. We have UHC, which was Sicily's difficult time because at the end of it, we, we didn't see anything. And during that time, uh, NHIF was in problems. So that tells you something that probably, not even probably, that our problem is not at the top of the ministry, but the technocrats and the bureaucrats who have mastered the system, they know what works where, mm. and 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 they they are they know what what to do and what not to do. So if you sort out those middlemen, middle people there who have been running the shows, then maybe something will change. But as long as you're just addressing the top and leaving the people who make the cogs move, yeah. then we are going to continue with this. So I'd... we will talk about COVID millionaires. Uh, we will accuse Kagwe. We'll then probably fire, get him fired. Will in, then they will come and we will get another scandal. So we need to address what is at the core, at the heart of that ministry. And if it means moving people or throwing them in, because here at the Ministry of Health, unfortunately, it's a matter of life and death. And now with COVID, we are continuing to count death. I it's dare venture and say that it's also private sector. I mean, there are private sector players who may be involved in this. When you talk about the kind of money that's being made in that ministry, it's not the junior officers who go and procure and supply. There must be, they must be responding to somebody's tune. So until the point, look, NYS, you come up with, I mean, a scandal is unearthed in NYS and individuals are arrested and taken to court, both in public service and in private sector. And they are told that these people were involved in the shoddy business that took place in NYS 1, NYS 2, the same. When we go to other departments, we see the same thing happening. In the Ministry of Health, all we see is changes and changes and changes. During Moi Kibaki's time, we had the same. There was even a time when this ministry was split into two, public health and medical mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. Then it was brought back together.
problems. Mm -hmm. Same, same thing. Talk about KMTC, talk about KEMSA. Talk about, and you what is never it? see heads directly rolling. rolling. Even till to, look, look you just at see what ministers and, and, and PSAs moving, mm. but nothing changes. Over time, and look at what we've been talking about. Even now, Dr. Mercy, you talked about the fact that even with this COVID donations, there was part of it which was supposed to go towards the blood crisis. Till today, mm -hmm. nobody has said anything, anything, about, it. anything about blood. We, we, nobody has talked about blood. Meanwhile, nothing. the entire country, go now, try to donate blood today in a public facility. Nothing. What will you be told? We're not accepting because we're not able to deal with it. Till today, country still doesn't have. Six years after the United States government pulled out of this project and decided that we're going to allow you to do it on your own. But we're not going to just drop you in the sand like that. We're going to release you slowly and we give you the help mm -hmm. to be able to get on it on your feet. Never happened. Till today. Mm. Can you imagine an entire ministry running something that is actually not moving? It's moving in imagination. It's not happening. But still, heads will never roll. Because it's we're dealing with top layer things whereby the inside has There's a cancer. Head. We have never dealt with the cancer. And never. there's a cancer at the Ministry of Health. You can go and fire anybody. We had one of the former PSs in this ministry, Professor James Olakiapi, sat here on the hot seat and he gave us his personal experience. Hmm. He said, I got into that ministry. I had come from environment. I went into this one. I was <laughs> like, my good Lord. <laughs> I'm at a, attending a meeting uh, at the coast and I get a call and I'm told you will receive a call from somebody in five minutes. In mm. five minutes later, someone mm -hmm. calls and says, you know what, there's uh, X amount of money for you if you just approve this particular. Mm -hmm. And I said, I mean, this is a kind of rot that's there. And you will never ever know how far up it goes or far, how far down it goes. So until that moment when we are told that ESCC has come at Afi House, ESCC going to Kemsa, ESCC going to whatever other institution, I sit back and I say, ESCC BS. going to Kemsa is that you've been having chills and a fever for four days and you have a headache and then you realize that something is going terribly wrong and then somebody comes and offers you a Panadol. That's what ESCC going to Kemsa is. Whereas what you need is triple bypass surgery and that's not happening. You take a Band-Aid and you try to fix it on a hemorrhage. It's not mm -hmm. working. It's you not must work. deal with the problem. Triple bypass if, if it were me, actually, I would, <laughs> they move a vein from if it the were me, I would heart. just close the entire ministry, send everyone home and just have a, a new crop of people who do not know what the system is all about, who, who will just start from scratch. You know? Like literally bringing down that that building and everything and everyone in it. So it that just it makes it cheaper for the people. guys. So instead of now bribing somebody with 30 million because you've worked here for so long, I just give you three. <laughs> You have made my work so much easier. <laughs> you lack it. It's okay. <laughs> so we now, with healthy. all of, I mean, Dr. Messi, now with all of these things taken into consideration, isn't it then that your, your first thought then, with all of these things from blood to mess that is the mess to uh, NHIF to all of these things going wrong, isn't it then that your first thought would go to the fact or to the belief that money has been stolen, equipment didn't go where it's supposed to go, donations then were taken and sold, wouldn't that be the likely thought that you would have? Actually, yes and no, because if you consider one of the things that happens in a country like ours, quietly, but very steadily and very surely, is that the very victims who are the monenchi get to a point where they all develop what you call a Stockholm Syndrome. Mm. They actually identify with the oppressor, and they don't even know they're identifying with the oppressor. When you allow yourself to be given 50 shillings, you're identifying with the oppressor. When you allow yourself to receive money simply because you feel you've committed a traffic offense and you want whatever it is, what you're doing is you're identifying with the oppressor, meaning you've acknowledged that what they are doing, you can also do, because that's mm. what you're actually doing. Mm. You may not think so. Mm. And it we can blame the mandarins up there, and, and but... At even the lowest level of the Monainchi, we all participate in this national sport of impunity. <laughs> it's, it's, it's opportunities that prevent us from being grand and, and going large scale. But Kenyans participate in this sport wholesale. And it's even considered normal mm. to bribe to sort out a problem. That's why there was a time I said, yeah, why don't we just legalize this thing so that we understand. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's formal business. We, we know. And a receipt is issued. 
for this sort of business so that I don't go to court, yeah. I, 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 I pay 3,000 bob. <laughs> Let's take a break and say goodbye to our audience on KTN Hope. We want to thank you very much for joining us on KTN Home. This is a situation, Rubens Kenya's biggest conversation. We broadcast on Spice FM every morning on 94.4 in Nairobi, in Mombasa, 87.9, in Kisumu, 102.5, 96.0 in Nakuru, 96.7 in Eldoret, Nyeri, we are on 90.9, and Malindi, 97.7. You can catch us anywhere, wherever you are, on your mobile device by just going to social media, Spice FM, KE, Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. We also live stream the show there. We want to say thank you very much for tuning in to our audience on KGN Home. Join us again tomorrow, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. However, if you are on Spice FM, keep it right here because this conversation continues until 10 o'clock. This is Kenya's biggest conversation with CT Muga, Nduoko, Eric Latif, and on the line is Dr. Marcy Korir at 8 minutes to 9. Spice FM, Nieri. Spice up your life. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. All right, so, this done. so what are you saying that we do to... Now, let's start with just accountability for COVID-19 funds. COVID-19 response in everything, in receiving donations, in receiving money, in uh, responding to all that. How do we approach this? Well, Dr. Mercy, it ask, I'm asking, is it possible, right? To you get a, No, wait now. Right. You get a, co a consignment, just as an example, you get a consignment of equipment. Is it possible that you say, all right, we use this today and this is how we were able to um, dispense such, such and such and then have that on record? Is it possible or is it something that uh, is far from the human imagination? That's what I'm saying. For me, where we are now, it's the National Emergency Response Committee that was chaired by the Minister, the CS for Health, Kagwe, who did to come out and give us a blow-by-blow -blow account of all the donations that came in, mm. of all the monies that were, because we got uh, donations in kind and in cash. The loans that we got, because the World Bank money was not a donation but a loan, and any other, you know, support that we got. And they give us a blow-by-blow -blow account of where each shilling went, where each mask, each glove went, so that we can pick that conversation from there. Unfortunately, um, from from um, Okari's story yesterday, they were talking about uh, uh, some of the records that that uh, Kemsa had at the Senate committee was, not truthful they were lies mm. so let them bring that out now we will decide for ourselves if it is true or not because if they tell us that a hundred masks were given to eric's hospital we'll go and be able to find out if at, if at all those masks were, were received mm. then we will pick the conversion from there but for me where the buck stops on this covid funds in kind and in cash and in loans is at the National Emergency Response Committee because they were the ones who were tasked with the responsibility of making sure that we do not see the kind of havoc that COVID is wrecking on the country so mm -hmm. far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that, that for me is where the buck stops. And, and, then, and then second for me is we need uh, people to speak up, especially our healthcare workers, because at the end of the day, they are the ones who are directly bearing the brand of this. Mm. Um, of all of these heist and mismanagement and everything because they are still expected to go to work and they are not well kitted, they are not well covered even their welfare loan is not even assured they are still paying for their own bills in the same hospitals that they work in they need to speak up and say some of these things because that is the only way mm. we are able to get something done we may not get everything done but, but at least it will be something. something done when when they speak up because by them 
speaking up and telling us what the issues are, then we, as regular wananchis who are innocently going to seek health care services, will be protected. Because as you have kept saying, they are our last line of defense. Um, so we need we need them, much as they are on the front lines and as the last line of defense, they need to defend us by speaking up and saying what the mm. issues are. Because if you are supposed to get... Um, 500 masks and you're only given 20 and there are 500 of you who will get who will not get who will work and who will not work it's a big issue so we, we and need, also i think speak about it as as uh, as the medical professionals speak up we also need to look back at what we did in 2010 in august 2010 kenya promulgated a new constitution that said that this constitution we are now going to be governed by institutions we have several watchdog institutions in this country that are completely asleep. So we saw, yes, the ombudsman the other day demanding some explanation. We have other institutions like parliament. We are seeing in Okari's story, one of the senators who was quoted there was saying, now you know what, this one, mm, it's, it's karma. Beyond me. It's mm -hmm. Really? What is the role of the institutions in this? And maybe now there's another conversation that we can have. Parliament, for instance, has the complete oversight and mandate to demand a blow-by-blow -blow account of mm -hmm. every shilling that has been spent in the fight against COVID-19. After all, they are the ones that approved this budget. So mm -hmm. if Parliament sits back and watches, and then they'll come back one time and say, you know, we asked these questions, and we were not given uh, uh, correct answers, it'll be too late, and it'll be an institution that will have failed us. You see, where you have a problem is whenever it is imputed that some of our lawmakers are also involved and they are party to some of these yeah. issues that mm. are being raised. Mm. So then you wonder, mm. how can they judiciously oversee something that they themselves have a hand in? They're the and profiteers of they this can. thing. That's another problem altogether. And, and then looking at it, uh, as you talk about institutions, um, health, they say, is a devout function. Other people say it's a shared function. But majority, 90% plus of our health functions are in counties. Yeah. So why weren't counties even given these monies directly and these donations directly to manage for their own counties, for example? Mm -hmm. Why was it all a national government uh, preserve? Because the plan you know? was to steal. We are coming to the top of the hour, Masi. <laughs> Stay on the line. <laughs> Listen to today's proverb from C.T. Muga. When a person is coming towards you, you need not say, come here. Mm. What do you say? Just observe them as they come. <laughs> Abdullahi Awar says the one that comes cl closest to in his mind is Mwenye Macho Hambi Witazama. Hmm? Mwenye Macho okay, Hambi Witazama. Yeah. Hmm. Comes closer mm. to that. Macho being the plural for Jicho. Mm. Okay. Mm. Macho yako moja ama macho tatu yote. <laughs> if there is more than one macho, <laughs> it's, a, it's macho. It's a, <laughs> macho. Good morning. It's nine o'clock. Keep it right here. The conversation continues. <laughs> Spice FM, Nairobi. Okay, all eyes on Mombasa this Traffic. morning where the road construction that is still going on at Kibarani in Mombasa plus the heavy rains that they experienced last night is what is compounding the traffic situation this morning so it's quite crazy in that area if you're headed in that direction you might want to be aware that the traffic is more than bumper to bumper almost bumper on top bumper at this point guys so in mombasa it's going to be a tricky morning hopefully that will be cleared out sooner rather than later mombasa road is also chocker blocked right now and it's just in a particular area though once you get past um uh, General Motors, you should be fine. Until you then get towards Bellevue, headed towards um, the Nyayo Stadium roundabout. And we also saw the accident that happened right around Kisarian. So that's going to affect traffic on um, uh, Langata Road today. Okay, so this is what we see right now. It's Monday morning. It's manic already. It's crazy around the country. We'll keep an eye on it. Spice of MKE. That's how you can get in touch with us and let us know what you see. <laughs> This
This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga. Researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power. And Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the situation room. It's two minutes after the only way to start your day. It's important to add the half because Specifics it's are good. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. two and a half minutes after nine o'clock. It's the situation room. Kenya's biggest conversation. Joining us on the line this morning is KTN's medical journalist, Dr. Mercy Career. Mercy, we were talking about institutions and saying, look, these are um, institutions that are in place, paid for uh-huh. and sustained by the taxpayer. And the role of these institutions is to ensure that things are going, are being done right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, even when we were speaking to uh, Martha Karua last week, she was like, okay, look, we have institutions in place. We are not seeing any of these institutions coming up to speak. We have an institution called the Ombudsman, the Commission on Administrative Justice. After Martha Karua's concern is when we saw the chair of this institution, Florence Kajuju, holding a press conference to say, you know what, uh, the government must account for every shilling. <laughs> After. We have also seen, for example, the story by Dennis Okari yesterday on NTV was quoting a lot of um, the chair, the current chair now of the Ad Hoc Committee on COVID-19 mm-hmm. in the Senate. And she was saying, karma, the karma that's going to befall them, that is the COVID-19 millionaires, is going to be like no other. The Bible talks about four generations of a curse that will follow. It will hit them hard. They will never know peace. This is according to Senator Sylvia Kasanga, who is the chair of the Senate Ad Hoc Committee on COVID-19. And immediately we saw that on, on social media, people saying, mm-hmm. if the people who are supposed to be watching on our behalf <laughs> are now saying, now let's leave it to karma to do the job, where are we? Does this point to the fact that we are at a point where we then will not get answers directly from people until God intervenes? Um, I think more or less as Kenyans, and this is uh, sad to see, we are on our own. Uh, and, and remember one of the headlines of the standard when we started covering COVID was that, you know, we are on our own quite literally because um you find that there's a big disconnect between the people who are sitting in boardrooms and making decisions and what one inch need. Because let's take an example of uh, when we, in this very, very same situation room, were discussing issues of uh, quarantine, mm. where people were forced into quarantine to pay for themselves. And yet we are seeing at that time, remember, money had come in and some was earmarked for quarantine and isolation. Yeah. Yet, Kenyans were made to pay for themselves. When it, come, it came to testing, now people are not able to, to get testing yep. in public health facilities. Yeah. That tells you that what happens in the boardrooms versus what the Mwanainchi needs is totally on opposite directions. There's a huge so, disconnect. There's a very, very big disconnect. So we are left to our own devices, of our, to our own ways of, you know, surviving. So when, when you get that the chair, the ombudsman, is asking the ministry to account, the same way we are asking the ministry to account, mm. what does that tell you? When the chair of the ad hoc committee on health, uh, the Senate, has given up, what does that tell you? Yeah. That really there is a bigger monster somewhere that these people are unable to slay. Because for me, these are the people who should be acting, not asking for accountability, the way we are the father state ask for accountability. And two, why is the ministry, why is the National Emergency Response Committee waiting to be asked to account? <laughs> yeah. Yet, it 
should be obvious that they need to account for Mwananchi. That is our money. And you'll be our answering the questions directly. The exactly. exactly. Judy is calling from Lolongo. Let's hear what Judy has to say. Good morning, Judy. Good morning, Eric. Good morning, Du. CP, how are you? Good morning, Fine, thank you. Good, good. What what uh, we saw yesterday on TV was very pitiful, shameful, and very embarrassing, I must say. Mm. All right. Mm. But uh, I have a question for Dr. Maxi Kori. Go and ahead. And the question to her is this. Now, uh, where I currently work, eh, we normally... We took our, our employees to be tested for COVID at, uh, at, at Camry. Mm -hmm. But now this one, uh, the, we have another batch that we need to send, but it seems that nobody is doing the tests anymore. Where Kenyatta is saying we're only taking people who have uh, symptoms or, you know, who are in hospital. Bagata is not doing any tests. Uh, Camry has stopped doing the tests. So my question is, where are all these numbers where you're saying that the 8,000 who have been tested, are they the mass testing? And if so, where is this mass testing that people can actually go to be tested? And if not, I don't believe that the 8,000 or 10,000 people who've gone to the Aga Khan or the Nairobi Hospital where testing is 13,000 and above. So, you know... Mm -hmm. Is it part of this uh, shenanigans that is going on uh, that maybe the reagents are being held to be taken somewhere else? What is going on? The issues of testing, yes. Dr. Masi. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, th that has been a very dicey question. <laughs> uh, it, it, you know, one of, one of those uh, things that sometimes gives me sleepless nights because mm -hmm. there is a lot of drama around it. So one um, is that our results are late by at least one week, two yep. weeks. Yep. On average about 10 days and we covered this. Eh? Mm. So the results that will be announced today are for samples that were taken say some 10 days ago. This is because one, we now obviously do not have capacity to test. So people are going out taking swab samples of people across the country that they are all queued so it's on a first come, first served. So the, there's been a backlog of, of tests. And they can only do so much because of issues of reagents, personnel, and all of those things. Because, what are these issues uh, of reagent? Is this also another issue of not of procurement and no clarity in procurement? Uh, so th th this one I haven't been able to get to the bottom of. But um, initially, we did not... Ha okay, so for you to run a test, you need several issues, several things. Mm. From the swab that you see people going, that will actually take the sample. Then when you get... Before you get to the lab, you have to transport that swab, which is transported on something called a virus transport media. Then when you get to the lab, there are different reagents that you work on to be able to extract the viral, let me call it DNA, that yeah. is RNA, yeah. for you to test. So there are several components before now you can run and say you have COVID or not. So if one of these things is missing, you'll have a backlog. Remember there's a time we didn't have swab, swabbing, um, swab sticks. Mm -hmm. Then there's a time we didn't have viral transport media. Then yeah. there's a time we didn't have reagents. So these things, when they miss at one point, they disrupt the whole testing uh, process. And then there's a time we had so many samples being taken. There was a backlog because you've taken so many samples, but you've not changed the number of personnel that you have in your laboratory. Yeah. So obviously they are going to work in the same, in the same manner because you don't expect them to work 24 hours a day. They'll work their shifts. They'll get tired at some point also. They need a break. So all of these things have really contributed into the whole grinding down of testing and now they're like two weeks late which for me is really pointless because um this if, if you need a test result today to make a decision if it's going to come two weeks later then there's mm. no point of actually testing and to the specifics of judy's question because judy uh, still yes. is at a point where she'd like to get her staff her and her colleagues tested and she's wondering so where do we go so for me, it's not a matter of where do you go. I would, I would 
I would look at it from um, why do you need to know the results? The result or your status? Yes, the status, I mean. Mm. Why do you need to know the status? Do you need to know the status of everyone or a few of the people? Because at the end of the day, the, the treatment or the management is the same. You need to isolate. You need to go into quarantine for 10 days. So if it is critical, mm. then, then there are alternatives mm. where you can get your lab results or lab status immediately, which unfortunately is a private facilities. If it is not critical and everyone can go into isolation or quarantine for 10 days, then that's okay. After all, the new um, guideline is after day 10 of quarantine or day 10 of isolation, everyone is assumed now to be discharged mm. from isolation from and isolation. quarantine. Because, yes, after day 10, the virus, even if it is there, it is not infectious. Because we've seen people can shed the virus even up to 60 days. But it does not mean it is infectious. Mm. So I, I would look at it from that aspect. We, are, we have actually reached a point where we don't have to make those decisions as individuals, mm. as companies, as associations, because um, what we are seeing happening with our government, you you have to, as you said, we are on our own. We are on our own. We kill them to 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 <laughs> make our own them. decisions. Lawyer Okello calling in from Mombasa. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? We're fine, thank you. Um, I hope you're all keeping safe. We are. We are. We are. Yeah. We are right. trying. Now, now, my question is, and, and probably it is like like the the previous caller. Um, we would like to know how to protect our families and stuff like that. And uh, we would like to take tests. We don't know where these tests are coming from, but um, now we, we, we see that um, we have 30,000 um, COVID-19 uh, confirmations. And the number of deaths are are uh, happily low mm. although that re creates a sus certain suspicion are the numbers are the numbers adding up what is your suspicion uh, okay either either um, the, the 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 numbers are being hyped up so that some people somewhere can send money so that uh, some mandarin somewhere can eat or um, as as was you you brought someone from somalia who was showing um, that uh, the, the, the grave diggers something eh? mm -hmm. yeah where the numbers were being uh, hyped down for whatever reason so either they are being suppressed so, or they are being amplified. But you don't think that yes. they are where they are is the correct position? I don't think they are where they are. I don't think they are where they are because they don't add up. If you have 30,000 people suffering from uh, COVID-19, mm. that was Italy in uh, in April. You, 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 you probably would be having a lot more deaths. All right. So it's about the same issue, though, that uh, where you started with. It's, it's about testing. You heard what Dr. Masi was responding to, Judy. Why do you need to be tested? Why I need to be tested is um, I, I, I go to work most of the week. Mm -hmm. I need to come back to the house. I can't have tests every day, mm -hmm. but I should probably have a general state of where I am so that I can protect my family. You know, if I come into the house mm -hmm. and I know that I am positive, then I know that I should isolate myself. But if I don't know, mm -hmm. um, then that, that puts me and my family and whoever I react, uh, uh, whatever, whoever I do, uh, meet at risk. Yeah. So we, we are hearing that tests have been done, mass tests, but I can assure you there are no tests being done in Mombasa. Mercy, respond to that. So, yeah. So one is that look at this test as a certificate of good conduct. And that's yes. what I've been saying all along. It's only as good as at the time 
that it is tested, that the swab is actually taken, not even when you get your result or status back. Because if I test today, uh, the 17th of August, even if I get my result on the 19th, it only means as at 17th of August, I did not have COVID if it is negative. It does not say that between 18 and 19, I wasn't exposed and gotten it. So for me, my advice to our good friend from Mombasa and any other Kenyan is that assume everyone has COVID-19 until proven otherwise. Because that way, you'll be able to be more strict on your protective and preventive measures, like washing your hands, maintaining physical distance, making sure that if you need to travel, it is absolutely necessary. When you're in Amatatu, you've opened all the windows for good ventilation. So assume that everyone has COVID and even yourself until proven otherwise. So that when you go home, the first thing you do is to clean up before you interact with your family members and make sure also that your home is always cleaned all the time. Because doing a test will not really change much. So for me, the only people that I think deserve or should have their test is somebody who is symptomatic and needs care because then you need to know what kind of uh, services, health services to provide them. And you need to also prepare should this person deteriorate, do you have um, critical care facilities? Are they very ready for them? Remember that 93% of the 30,000 do not have any symptoms. Mm. That means about 27,000 plus Kenyans. It's just because they are being tested either through contact tracing or this uh, quote-unquote mass testing by the Ministry of Health, which really was just like oh, targeted testing, yeah. that they found incidentally that oh, so-and-so also has the virus, oh, so -so, not that they were sick. So that means even if we were to test the whole population in Kenya, we can safely assume that nine, at least 90% will not have any symptoms, only 10%. Really? So looking at the problems that we have, we should reserve the testing to the 10%. Anyone else who doesn't have symptoms or anyone else who's otherwise healthy should just make sure that they have prevented themselves as much as possible mm. from getting the virus. Let's hear from Elijah in Nairobi. Good morning, Elijah. Good morning. How are you guys doing? We're Good, fine, thank thanks. you. Fine, thank you. Yeah, so I think I agree with what Dr. Murphy is saying. Look, testing, what we've been doing so far is looking at the ability of our government to test, not at the true prevalence of disease. There's a study that came out at least over a month ago where they had taken blood, blood donor samples and they found a positivity rate of 12% in Nairobi alone. Mm -hmm. Um which extrapolated was a figure of about 600,000 people in Nairobi over a month ago. Now, just because we are testing, you know, X number of people and then we say this is the number of people we have, we are, we are giving statistics on our ability to test because in one day we were talking about 300 infections. South Africa was talking about 13,000 infections in that day. But if we haven't even tested 10,000 people in a day, how can we then confidently say we only have 300 new infections? Mm. If you look at the numbers that are rising in the U.S., it's largely because of the scale of testing they're doing. And this getting a negative COVID test gives a very false sense of security. Yeah. Because you then think, oh, I don't have COVID. Yeah, you didn't have COVID five days ago. What do you have now? The people you interacted with, how long before you get it? It would be amazing if we could shift the discussion from how many people are positive to what do we do to stay healthy so that even if we get it, we are in the 90-something percent who will be asymptomatic True. or mildly asymptomatic. True. Because that then will inform us. Right now what we are doing is deceiving ourselves and to an extent causing panic. Panic is relevant, but attitude change doesn't occur long-term because of fear we need to feel empowered be informed so that we can have a healthier nation and by so doing reduce the effects of this thing that's true thank you very much elijah
It's a situation room, Kenya's biggest conversation. We are talking about COVID-19, the fight against COVID-19, and on a broad scale, demanding accountability for everything. The decisions, like you said, Ndu, who knew what, when, what decision did they make? Yep. Right? And that, that still has got to be um, really, really uh, at the center of a conversation as a country. It has to be, absolutely. I mean, what... We, because this is the thing, the headlines, they splash, um, we see the news pieces, they're done, and then by the second, third day, it's forgotten. And I dare say that those who sit at the very heart of whatever scandal might be, understand also this attitude, understand the national psyche, that people are going to make noise for a minute, and then it's going to be forgotten, and then they can carry on doing whatever it is that they want to do. And I think at the point where we are, it's very necessary for people to be able to open their mouths, make a little bit of a noise, ask the questions, Ask the question until they're answered. And I think there's also this perception that, well, you know, I don't really ha- I don't really have to answer a question. Well, yes, you do. And I don't you don't have to you, you, you really you wait until things are blown out of blown out of proportion before you give an answer. <clears throat> Unfortunately, you do. Because when these things came, they were public. When these announcements were made, they were public. When COVID was announced in the country, it was public. On the 13th of March, it was on the steps outside there of that great building and it was made public money that was coming in was made public those who were donating it didn't do it in a corner and whisper into someone's ear and say oh by the way we're giving you something no no it was made public it was made it was made general for everybody so guess what in the expending of the same thing that must be made public so when your people are asking you a question when your people are asking you a question you are duty bound to answer with the truth you know, I sometimes get the impression we're talking to ourselves. It could look, it's, and that's. I think I think it's all right. I think it's all right. It's okay. But the problem is that we we have that, and we may talk to ourselves, and they say, "Okay, we're talking to ourselves. We get tired." Mm. But guess what? You repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. Somebody is bound to hear you. Well, not necessarily repeat it. Repeat you know it. what I usually say is that um, as a fourth estate, at the very least. Our job is to make sure that we have documented this. I let the record show that in this same situation room, we asked all these questions that we had been asking all these questions. Let the record show that we wrote in the newspapers, we did these stories, and we did ask. Because when people are looking back at all of this, we should not be in the part of history where we had a chance to question and ask, and we, we didn't. Quiet. Mm-hmm. We'd rather ask. Let them not respond, but we'll keep asking until the day we'll get answers. But I, also I remember, the there are people that we pay to ask. The people that you pay to ask told you that no. God will help you. No, those yes. ones also, uh-huh. they need to answer. Those said I, that, I Karma, it's no, okay, I, that the, the Bible said that they will be dealt with to the fourth generation. That's not an answer. As true as it may be, that's not an answer. They, what's her name? She herself, who said this and talked about karma, she also has... A, Oversight. What's oversight about? They're supposed to be asking mm-hmm. the questions. You can't leave it to the heavens and In hope some that way, you can feel her frustration. Okay, maybe, you know, at some point she's saying, or we, we have done this, we have come up with a report, we sat, we have um, summoned Kemsa, we have summoned all these other uh, personalities and offices, and they've come, they've given us their answers, we've come up with a report, which we, we've tabled the report. And if you actually listen to what she was saying, sometimes you get, she says, you get frustrated at how slow things are. You come up with a report, and that's all. That's all you do. You come up with a report. The next thing is that report has to be debated. Okay, it takes time before that report is debated. Once it's debated, it also takes time because your colleagues, some of your colleagues who are in the same chamber are, like you said, city compromised already. Are the nitty-gritty so that we're asking? So it's in their interest that this matter is never moves. Are the nitty-gritty the that we're asking? This is Now, This when we're talking about the nitty-gritty, mm. Is the nitty-gritty in that report? Is it that certain questions are being asked to this individual who sits in this position, who had the responsibility for this particular activity? Has that person been asked and the person said, this is what I'm saying? Because usually it's glossed over and said that X amount came and such a person gave. No, going down to the detail. Because guess what? The overarching um, um Assumption is that people will not ask the important questions and that people can continue to get away with murder. That's the thing. 
Actually, the... I'd like to give an example of Please. the managed equipment services. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, when, when it started in 2014, 2015, uh, back then I was a practicing doctor questioning the managed equipment services. And there was this all who labaloo about now we can diagnose cancer, I don't know, we can do all of these things. But when you looked at the record of the equipment being supplied and the whole premise of the leasing, it did not make sense. So we questioned back then as as doctors. Then that thing came to find me here now as a journalist, <laughs> and we are still questioning. Mm-hmm. And the thing I'm happy about it is back then in 2014, 2015, we never thought it would even make it to the floor of parliament for mm. questions to be asked, for the CSs to be summoned to give an answer. But now we are there. Seven years, six, seven years, it is a slow move, but there's some progress. Hopefully, with this one, the progress will be faster than the managed equipment. So for me, asking, questioning, even if it gets frustrated along the way, is important. Because at some point, all of these people, they're not always going to be there. Some are going to die, because mm. that is the way of life. Some are going to retire. Some are going, you know, that is life. Other new people will come in and you'll be able to look at these things differently. No, so as a long chance. as there is a record, as long as there's a record, Eric, it doesn't matter how long it takes. Not a chance, Dr. Masi. Since 1963. Is... Once it it depends on the 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 weight of the person that you are dealing with. Look, if you talk about small fish here and there. You will talk about small fish in NYS, you will take them to court, you will, you know, prevent their children from flying to Germany and all. Those are small fish. But the big fish, you will not even touch them. Here we are talking about MES. You wait for that report that comes out of the Senate. She, the, the vice chair of that committee asked for more time so they can work on a proper report. That report is expected in, in the coming weeks. You think it's going to mention personalities and say that this person is culpable and that's therefore we ex- expect investigations or action to be taken against this person? We have never seen such a kind of a report before, so I don't expect such a report to come to the floor of the House in that form this time. Uh, Same I'm questions that we're asking about it, COVID-19. It takes, mm-hmm. it takes time, but remember... How long, Luther Mercy? How, how long? How many Luther generations? King, wait, wait, wait. Martin Luther King himself told us the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. It's not going to happen now. It will take time. It may not even happen in our lifetime, but there will be justice at the end of it. That's, you're that's, that's you're, you're I, an extremely I, I optimistic <laughs> individual, Mercy. <laughs> That one, that, that one, uh, and also sometimes, by the way, that one is when you also lift your hands up, just like that uh, senator and saying, We leave this to karma. One day, one day, Mutakipata, even if it's the fourth generation, right now, this current generation is suffering. This current generation is suffering, and the people that are there, they're the duty holders. Those are the people that need to be answering those questions today. We don't want their children to be answering that, yo, how did your father acquire this, your grandfather acquire this. No, we want today. People are suffering today. There's COVID today. There are doctors who are contracting COVID-19 today, getting exposed to just because somebody somewhere decided to use a company at the JKIA, and that company then played games and took off with donations that were meant to end up with the healthcare workers in this country. Let's take a break. Half past nine, it's a situation room. Kenya's biggest conversation, 0719-012600. It's an issue of accountability for COVID-19 fund. We want to look at what's happening, weather and traffic, and then the conversation continues. Good morning. Spice FM, Malindi. The weather All right, with it's warming Spice up ever FM. so slightly in Nairobi at 16 degrees. It's going to be highs of 23 and lows of 13 today with a chance of showers later in the afternoon. It's cloudy in Nyeri at 16, highs of 21 and lows of 13 and will be a wet afternoon. It's mostly cloudy in Nakuru at 16, highs of 24 and lows of 12. 
And in Elder, at, at mostly cloudy conditions at 17, thunderstorms are forecasted for later with highs of 20 and lows of 12 degrees. All right, Kisumu is partly cloudy at 23, highs of 28 and lows of 19 with showers expected later in the afternoon, as is Kakamega, which is currently at 20 degrees and mostly cloudy, will experience a high of 24. 26 degrees and mostly cloudy in Malindi, highs of 28 and lows of 23. We'll see a low of 23 in Mombasa as well with highs of 28 where it's mostly cloudy this morning. Taking a look into Kampala where it's likely to be a wet afternoon with highs of 26 and lows of 19. 30 degrees high and lows of 22 in Dar es Salaam, currently at 26 and mostly cloudy conditions. All right, it's warming up too in Johannesburg, now at 8 degrees. Mostly sunny conditions for the morning, but then gets down to cloudy conditions and highs of 20 and coming down to lows of 7. Clear skies in Lagos at 24 degrees. It will be a rainy afternoon, however, with highs of 29 and lows of 23. Let's take a last look into Europe, where in Paris, it's cloudy at 18. And it's going to be a wet afternoon with highs of 23 and lows of 16. 16 degrees in London and partly cloudy. Uh, highs of 22 and lows of 16. And it will be a thundery summer afternoon in New York, getting round to Monday morning at 21 degrees and cloudy conditions. They'll wake up to rain with highs of 28 and lows of 20. Spice up your life. All right, Mombasa's bearing the brunt of traffic this morning. Still um, showing to be pretty crazy today with that traffic because of the rains that took place last night and the construction that's going on um, in the Changamoy area. All right, coming into the city, though, it's getting a little bit better on Mombasa Road. Coming into the city from Thika Road as well, there's a bit of a hold-up from Survey right straight to the Pangani underpass, but it'll take you into town without too much of a problem. Looking at Jogo Road and then coming on the other side of town, looking at Langata Road, it's a bit slow as well, but you should be fine getting out of traffic hour officially. Um, so traffic wasn't too crazy this Monday. Hope it's better during the week. Spice of MKE, in case you run into something, you can always let us know. We'll spread the word. Chilled Spice. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Seven minutes to ten o'clock. The conversation continues with Eric Latif, Nduo Ko, C.T. Muga, Dr. Mercy Career. We are talking about accountability for COVID-19 fight. Uh, and the question is, who should be ans answering these questions? I look at some of these reports and I think there's also an element. I don't, know if, I don't know if I want to call it fear or you might feel intimidated without anybody actually opening their mouth. But I think some of these reports could do a lot more in terms of justice to ask questions mm. uh, because it glosses over the major issues and really doesn't even look into the nitty gritty, which clearly is important when you're looking at something like this. Because the question that you started asking from the beginning when we started talking about this an hour ago, Eric, or two hours ago is, look, we can talk about the numbers and it looks all very, you know, romanticized and nice. However, what's the detail to the, to the end of it? Who's responsible? You can't tell me that as we sit here, we don't know who's responsible. For example, reception of equipment, you know, disbursement of funds, you know, accountability when it comes to the usage of those funds. There are people there, they have these jobs. Mm. Where were they? What were they doing? Mm. And I think those are the elements of such reporting that should come out. If it doesn't come out, then you might as well have my three-year-old write the report. So more detail. because we know if, if we're talking about um, donations arrived at JKIA on, on a certain date, then the government had mandated this particular company to clear the, 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 the goods. And this is the individual. This who is was. the individual who was in charge. And from this point, the goods were supposed to arrive here. At this point, who was in charge? So mm. where did this go? Uh, 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 and if somebody comes and says, you know what, I, I received a call, then tell us, who called you? You know, you know when you talk of cartels uh, in, the, in our ministries, mm. you say, we forget that cartels are actually made of individuals who have arrived at a certain understanding that they want to do certain things in a certain way. Yep. Which means, let's move away from Afia House. What makes you think there's no cartel in the Senate? What makes you think there's no cartel in, in the National in Assembly? Assembly? 
What makes you think there is no cartel in the police? There is definitely cartel in the Senate and in the National Assembly. Hmm. And when you get to a point where it's it's so rampant and so open. Accepted. And accepted. <laughs> that in such a case, for example, today they are supposed to go back and vote on this uh, on this formula, right? Yes. The conversation among senators is how much, how much, who's who's in the corridors of the Senate distributing money. To the point where you even have and this, uh, the people that we're talking about are not, you know, corporate individuals. No, no, no. It's government officers, state officers, who are being said to be in the corridors of Parliament distributing. Oh, you know, last week it was five million. What were you We were kula kakata. And well, those are the discussions, really, in reality. Yeah. So it actually makes you wonder, the so-called stalemate, is it, are they bargaining for more? Are they, what really, that, that's why I said, as far as I'm concerned, this whole drama is nothing. Mm -mm. It's games. No. And it pro it's choreographed. It, and it brings back that issue of that the whole system has been captured. Mm. So when you say that uh, Parliament is now investigating this, come on. It just takes somebody to go to the <laughs> toilets of parliament and give out some cash and remove some name here, make that report sound like it's very, very, very... You know, Eric, they may, they may actually even investigate. Dog. They may actually investigate because mm. investigating and getting the heart of the matter enables you to begin better. Yeah. So, so you actually do the work. But I want to bring the discussion back to the Monenji. Mm. You see? You see, how did we get to the point where we are complicit in the very things we keep complaining about. You see, take for an, take COVID. Huh? Yeah. What do you think our real problem with COVID is? Is it that is the disease that kills people? We've had diseases that kill people long before COVID, and they're still killing people. Mm -hmm. My mind, in my mind, it's change. There's something that human beings really do not like: change, and COVID is bringing change in a way that one, we didn't expect, didn't want, and we have no idea what to do with. Mm. But it's change. If you look at even what we're discussing now, mm. it's change. We're saying, mm -mm, it, it, this can't go on. Mm. Cannot continue like this. Now, instead of maintaining the status quo, we are questioning why the status quo has remained a status quo. And we're saying, fine, these things don't happen on their own. There must be people behind it. Who are they? You see, again, it, you're agitating for change, and there'll be pushback. Mm. Where nobody previously had ever to answer for something that they may no. have done before, no. or for funds that were used, or for donations that were received. No. Nobody ever had to be accountable. No. And now we are saying it is absolutely necessary that that happens. And we're saying, tell us exactly what you did with this. And it's being treated the same way with the, the, the silence that they're accustomed to. Mm. And yet, you see, this is where now... Our thinking, this one isn't going south. This one is going completely wrong. South is a euphemism. How on earth do you get to a point where something as simple, it's not costing you a thing. Mm. You're not being asked to give money. Mm. You're not being, it's not even yours. <laughs> it's not yours. Somebody has given even it. You. Okay. And it doesn't stop you from whatever thieving you've been involved in before. But you've decided that you must steal everything. And I mean literally everything. What on earth gets into people's minds to the point where they get to this, where they're so insensitive to anything else other than the need for them to steal? Yep. What is it? You, you keep it for yourself. Yes. It's Your whole discussion is and, about... And it has been there even since before COVID. Long we before. We talk about relief food distribution. Aye, aye, aye. And people just talk about how somebody who was a recipient of the relief food distribution was in charge of distributing it in a certain locality ended up being very rich. Yes. Because they sold it. Hmm. It did not end up with the people that were mm. supposed to receive it. In the and manner is, in which they should have. This is a culture that we have. And then we've got to get to a point where we say, no, it's got to stop. Jimmy Kimani is calling in from Malindi. Jimmy, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, all of you. We're fine, thank you, Jimmy. Otherwise, yes. Yes. What I wanted to insist on mm. is that you know here who is who is to blame. Yeah. We, the citizens of the Republic of Kenya, we are the ones to blame because we don't want to come up together. When the doctors are told not to strike by court, they strike. 
and people die. But we, the citizens of the Republic of Kenya, we don't want to come and hold our leaders responsible. Mm. If today we all collect signatures and we say that we want anybody that has been caught with corruption case must be and should be put in jail for life imprisonment and all his family assets, listen, all his family assets should be confiscated by the government. Mm -hmm. This is what we are supposed to put. But Jimmy, is that not a bit unfair? I mean, what if some of his family members didn't participate in, in, in his business very endeavors? Good. Yeah, very good. Look here. Because if you know that my mother's property will be taken and my brother's property will be taken, in NYS issue, we saw a whole family being taken, the, 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 their banks being, be, be being clamped. Bank accounts. Yep. Okay? So, it is very, very simple. You will be responsible over your family. Nobody will try to tamper with anything to do with corruption. Even your family Look, will, put, will hold you accountable. <laughs> yes. We'll make yes, sure that you so, don't steal. <laughs> yes. Thank because you. you're putting them in danger. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy. Let's hear from Priscilla. Priscilla, good morning. Good morning, Latif. How are you? Very well. Thank you. How is Nakuru? I'm very fine. Hi, City. Hi, Ndu. Good Hello. morning. Please, just to lighten up the mood. Say hello to Dr. Masi as well. She's on the line. <laughs> oh, sorry. Hi, Dr. Masi. <laughs> hello. Good morning, Priscilla. Good morning. Just something to lighten the mood. Yeah. And then I proceed with what I wanted to say. Do you know, when I started listening to Situation Room, mm. I used to wonder, what, Latif, why you're calling someone sweetie? Uh. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> then, <laughs> Yanni, just the other day, that's when I realized, when I now started following you on social media. Priscilla, on I, which I side of the bed did you wake up this morning? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay, Priscilla, it's, it's sweetie. I love or I cry. It's so <laughs> depressing. It's okay, you can stay with sweetie. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Anyway, okay. So mine yeah. is just there are people who have contributed, um, you know, most of the things I wanted to, to say. But uh, one thing I'm just begging and pleading. I, I think uh, Ndu and Dr. Masi might have said this. I'm just begging the fourth estate. Do not give me a BBI headline. Mm. You're the ones, I know I'm shifting blame. Mm. But when the newspapers and other media houses and other media forums start focusing on other things, this is how we forget. Mm. So I said on Twitter and on Facebook yesterday when, uh, the, during the expose, I said as long as we haven't brought this disease under control and we haven't put those culprits, those Sickening, sickening human, they're not even human beings. We've not put them behind the bars. Can these trend, please? Mm. You're yeah. very right. Don't, don't, don't give us BBI. Mm. Let Bravo. it be in our faces because these guys are depending on us to do we'll our forget. Kenyan thing and, yeah. Exactly. exactly. We'll forget, we'll move yeah. on, or we'll even pick up somebody and sacrifice them. We'll actually uh, yeah. hang Motai Kagwe right up there <laughs> and say, yeah. get yeah. out. So you guys are the expertise in the field. You have the means. Keep it trending mm. until we just prick those conscience of theirs. Thank you, Priscilla. Okay. Thank you, Priscilla. Okay, thank you. Have thank a good you. day. You too. Cheers. And I think it also gets to a point where we need to get to a level where we're starting to name names. All right? So this said. particular company, mm -hmm. who are the directors of this company? What is their relations to anybody else in this organization? Could they have use their position. Eric, do you remember the newspaper articles with, uh, the, the, that brought out the matter of procurement of COVID-related uh, issues in, in the county? They yeah. did mention names. Yep. Mm. They would mention mm -hmm. company. They would even tell you this company was registered last week. Last week. Yes. Mm. This company was given the work. They couldn't do it. Yes. So I think uh, Pr 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 Priscilla's prayers are clearly being answered. Mm. Uh, it, it is happening. But we need to move further up. Mm -hmm. Who are the people who encourage these people to form a company the week before yeah. so that they could get the standard that they oh, couldn't manage? These people, who are the godfathers? Mm -hmm. Who are the who are main the beneficiaries? People? Who yeah. are the ultimate beneficiaries of this process? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, you find um, like mm -hmm. one of the companies uh, that 
was highlighted yesterday, and it had actually been highlighted in the same studio in the papers, yep. had um, a certain lawyer who no one could really trace. So mm-hmm. you're even wondering if this is a real person mm-hmm. who registered the company just before um, getting the tender. Mm-hmm. So the question is, uh, who... who, who Whose hands are these that are, you know, controlling this puppet? Who's the real owner because of a company? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The Where would... does that buckle? But, but remember, Mercy, and... fingers have also been pointed to us as the fourth estate, mm. that we've also been complicit in this. Because it has also been said that part of the reason why some of these names never get to where they should get to is because some of our people are spoken to. Mm. Or seen. <laughs> or seen. Or influenced or seen. in one way or the other. Mm. Like now, the way I'm going to be influencing you by changing this topic and bringing Joffrey from Mombasa <laughs> into the conversation. Yes, j- just when I'm warming up. <laughs> Diverting your attention to Joffrey. Joffrey, good morning. Yes, good morning, Eric, Siti, and uh, Ndu, Masi, Dr. Masi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, thank you for the conversation, but it's unfortunate I want to accuse the members of the fourth sister. Go ahead. As much as you are helping us to know what is happening in this country actually is really making us sick because ranging from golden bug cattle to the anglo leasing mm-hmm. and many others that have lined up yeah. none of them we've seen people brought to books mm-hmm. so it's actually making us more sick the only solution i feel as kenyan since we've decided not to be patriotic we should just learn to live with it as we've learned to live with uh, HIV and now we are told to learn to live with COVID. So let us just learn to live with it because I don't see so any... So Jeffrey, what are you saying? So we, on this thing. so we should stop covering, stop highlighting any but stories around you COVID-19? See, what is happening is hmm. when something happens, when a scandal is brought to the limelight, to the public limelight, hmm. it runs for a while then you forget about it. You see, the moment you keep on discussing that conversation over the same thing and at least trying to find ways on how it should be approached, then I think a solution can be found. But you see, once you brought it on the limelight, then uh, sometimes you forget about it until such a time when you hear there is a case going on, then you bring it again, then it goes like that. So I mm. feel we should learn to live with this thing. Okay. Thank you, Jeffrey. You were saying, City. I was saying that Jeffrey has a point. <laughs> 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 he actually does have a point. But mm. if I may mitigate, the things happen on a daily basis. And sometimes we, we are even spoiled for choice as to what to discuss and what not to discuss and to what level we should discuss it. Mm. Uh, but his point is well made, and we've understood it. And uh, perhaps uh, on occasion, since he has our number and he has our details, every time he thinks there's something important that ought to be looked into, he could simply suggest and tell us. Mm-hmm. Prod a and little bit. Sure. Pro- prod us and say, guys, you know, you've forgotten about this issue and you discussed it a while back. Yep. Yeah, so please, c- c- can you revisit it? Let's go to our friends in Nakuru. We start with Karaoke from Wakulima Market, and I also see Zachary is on the line. Karaoke, good morning. Good morning to you guys. How are you? Fine, Fine, thank you, karaoke. Fine, thank you, karaoke. Uh, 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 well, I want uh, first of all uh, to congratulate you and especially uh, Corinne. I've been hearing about her for uh, quite a long time, maybe discussing various uh, problems that you are facing in terms of health. But uh, my question is despite what you've been doing all along, the fourth estate, you've been doing a very good job. Let me say that. I don't say, like, my friend was just left right now. Mm. I would say you have done a very good job to educate Kenyans or to what they are supposed to do. But my question is, mm-hmm. where are Kenyans? This is what I've been saying all along. Why mm. do we keep on talking, talking, talking? Look at the Belarusians, for, ex- for example. Mm. They are on the road for the 70 day, I don't, I don't know, something like that, 60 yep. or 70 day. Mm. They are demonstrating, they want their president out because it's doing nothing symbolical to what is happening in our country here the government that we elected that at the time is doing nothing especially uh if you think of the covid leave alone any other thing mm. the covid alone 
has shown to Kenyans that we are alone in this country. Where are you, Kenyans? It's time for us to wake up. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, Karaoke. Zachary. Zachary. Oh, hi. Hi. Oh, you're there. How is everyone? Everyone is fine. Thank you, Zachary. How are you? Oh, I'm happy. I'm happy. Today I've cleaned something. Mm Mm-hmm. Be as to as appertains the word city. Now I'm a bit uh, wiser. <laughs> you okay, are now, aware that I'm listening. Huh? I, I, I am. I am. I am. <laughs> <laughs> Please continue, Zachary. <laughs> and uh, you are doing good work. And uh, let me say, let me. Uh, oh, Masi is there. Masi, hi. <laughs> good morning, Zachary. I'm here. Oh, good morning. Good morning. You said something that uh, underpinned everything, yeah? that you said the work of the fourth state is to record mm. it is to tell the people the truth mm. so that when the right time comes for us to actually uh, uh, erect those who are going to represent us who are going to lead us we are supposed it is our youth to go back to the records look at them the way Masi has said mm. and be informed as we make as we make our decisions yeah so the fourth the state has done its work, mm. it should continue doing the same work. Yeah. It should not matter that okay, we are doing this and no change. No, 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 no. Uh, Eric and Latif and Morim and everybody else who is in the fourth state, you are paid. And this is a vocation. In fact, it's a vocation. It's more than even being paid. Mm. It is the work of the people and God that you are doing to inform people that this is the reality. Now, if 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 somebody who has stolen, decides, okay, now I'm going back to the grassroots and they're asking these people to elect me. It is me, Zachary, the, the, how boys I may be, mm. to question, now you guys. To use the, the information you that you have. Yeah, yeah, I was, what Masi said, I should, it is my duty to refer, who is Eric, you know? Mm-hmm. So that as I engage uh, with him, I know exactly, am I engaging with a hyena? Or am I engaging with a with a with a with a sensitive person who cares about me, or 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 a greedy a greedy whatever who is ready to pick all my money and to K to K money is that you know mm-hmm. you know it will come from what I have uh, invested yep. in engaging with the fourth state. Yeah, true, true. So you have Thank a responsibility, Asante Sana Zakari, the responsibility of everybody, plus the responsibility of the duty bearers. And I keep going back there. As long as we sit back and we call these people Mueshimiwa, and they are the ones who are getting into these particular offices and they're using their position to see, okay, so we have approved this budget. How much of this budget am I going to dip my hands in? As a person who has sat in the health committee, as somebody who has sat in the budget committee of parliament, as somebody who has sat in parliament and approved budgets and then i go back and now start asking the officers all right so now unajua tumepitisha hii pesa yenu now ile kazi ngumu tumefanya kazi ngumu sana tumefanya sasa ppes niko na kampuni kwanza ina supply ile first class and you know very well ile ambayo haina mashimushi mbingi first class first class Aira Ruki. Aira Ruki. Aira Ruki ataki nyesha. Unaita K word, K word. K90 ngapi? K90. Hiyo. Eh hiyo. Mm. In fact, hii yangu ni K100. It's funny but it's true. Yeah. Um from from the legislators definitely to Mwananchi to the fourth estate. Everyone if they played their role will not be here because you find in other countries when there is even a rumor that is a scandal, they resign. Yeah. But mm. here, people come and boldly say over my dead body. <laughs> so they walk around with their heads high like they, there's nothing. Yep. So everyone has a role to play. And, and for me, until the day when the people behind the people are felled by these allegations such that it doesn't matter who, whether you're related to the 
big people in the big houses or in the big offices, mm. you come down and you come down with those people. Yep. Only then can we start seeing some change. Because Absolutely. as long as people feel like they are protected by the who is who in the country, they will walk around. Like right now, people are going home, hugging their children and sleeping well. Yet, their families who have lost their children, their children who have lost their parents because of COVID-19, mm. just because they didn't have PPEs, for example, just because they didn't have testing early enough, yep. just because they didn't have oxygen. Yep. Yet they go home to their children and they play and they sleep soundly. Oh, yes. And these sharks, in fact, even read your stories contemptuously saying, <laughs> Yeah, right. They surely, think they can touch me. Surely, <laughs> Mercy. You, you, didn't even, you didn't even write the actual number. Mm. You, you, you or exactly how I did it. Yeah. <laughs> and and you think these journalists of this country. They can't even get their facts right. Yeah. <laughs> how <laughs> dare they how, how dare they, they accuse me of stealing just ten sub- million? Yes. When it was clearly hundred and fifty. It's unfortunate. It's really, really unfortunate. But but we cannot give up. Can't keep we quiet. must keep we must we keep shouldn't. raising these issues. Yeah. We must keep pointing yeah. fingers at the right offices. We must also make sure yeah. that we um, unmask those that we pay so that they can do this work. They need to do the work. Hmm. But we also must not let the ordinary citizen off the hook yep. because mm. they are party to this entire drama. Mm. Totally. Mm. And you must get to a point where people understand that public service means precisely that. Mm. That if your interest is to actually make oodles and oodles of money, then choose another line of, of work. work. Then get out yes. of here. But this one of ours, people get into public service because that's where you make easy money. Primarily. Yes. To make money. Reason. Yes. Primarily to make and money. And that's not, not what the public service is intended for. Oh, my goodness. But you know what makes it worse is mm. that when it spreads even to our churches and religious setups, mm. and that mindset takes residence and it becomes permanent, then you have, you, our problem is even compounded, compounded further. Yep. further. Yes. Mm-hmm. Coming to the end of the show in about two minutes, um, Dr. Masi, you've heard today's proverb, right? Yeah. And and uh, CT is asking whether we know any from our, our mother tongues, any any proverb that comes close to this. So CT, start 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 with, start with the proverb in English. When a man is coming or when a person is coming towards you, mm. you need not say, "Come here." Does it resonate mm. at all? You know, I, some some okay, do, some my don't. Mother, maybe in my mother tongue. My mother tongue, of course not. Mm. I, I'm not very privy to the proverbs in my mother tongue. Mm. But maybe Mwenyenjia mm. Mpisha. Mm. That can still be considered mother tongue, right? Very true. It yes, it is. It is. Swahili well, is definitely <laughs> our national mother tongue. <laughs> it is Mwenyenguvu Mpisha. Or it's yes. yes. A little editing here and there. <laughs> no surely. problem. We, 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 we're not going to quibble over a word or, or oh, yeah. the two here. Yeah. Yeah. It would have a totally different it's meaning, okay. but okay. Yes. No, in no, no, uh, no, no. in Nigerian? I, I don't know. <laughs> no, start with no Abi. Abi. Abi, I'll leave that thing. <laughs> yeah. There's no language like Nigerian. If Mondu come your way, mm. you know, no say come here. I do have something to say, though. Uh-huh. Okay. Happy birthday, Eric Latu. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. <clears throat> Eric has handled that one well. <sighs> Eric, you've taken it in well. Oh, very well. Man, for a guy, you're doing okay. <laughs> it <man>. landed very well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much, Dr. Masi Kaurir, for speaking to us today. And keep doing the good work. Thank you, thank you. We shall keep at it. We'll continue probing and asking. Yes, indeed. And making the comfortable and comfortable. Very good. Mm. Join us again tomorrow, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. for another conversation in the Situation Room. Good morning. It's now 10 o'clock.